আপনি জানেন আমি দুই হাজার পাঁচ থেকে দুই হাজার দশ পর্যন্ত ইসলামাবাদে ছিলাম সেখানে আমি দেখেছি একটা ছাত্র পিএইচডি করেছে সে পিএইচডি পিরিয়ডে দশটা পাবলিকেশন করেছে এবং তাকে কনভোকেশন কনভোকেশনের সাথে সার্টিফিকেট দেওয়া হয় দেওয়ার পরে সে যে কাজ করে তার জন্য তাকে দেড় লাখ টাকা দিচ্ছে অ্যাপ্রিসিয়েশন মানে দেড় লাখ এটা কেন করেছে যেন এটা দেখে অন্যরা উদ্বুদ্ধ হয় কেমন এটা এবং একটা দেয় যে এতগুলো কাজ করছে এবং প্রত্যেকটা ওয়েল স্টাবলি জার্নালে পাবলিশ করছে আমি যদিও জানি আমি কিছু কাজ করলে বলো যেগুলো পেপারে না বাট তারা মনে করে যে এটা ভালো কাজ করেছে তো তারপর যারা প্রফেসর হোক ছাত্র হোক যদি তারা কোনো পাবলিকেশন করে আইএসআই প্রত্যেকটা পেপারের জন্য দশ হাজার টাকা দেয় আমি কথা ছিলাম আমার ছাত্র কাজ আমি কথা ছিলাম আমার জন্য তারা আমি যে কয়টা কাজ করেছে ওরা আমার নাম আছে তার জন্য আমাকে দেড় লাখটা দেড় লাখ টাকা পাঠিয়ে দিয়েছে আমি আসার পরে সেটা কিন্তু ইয়ে করে নেই চিন্তা করতে পারবেন না চায়না তো আমি গেছিলাম পরে আপনি থাকতে তো গেলাম তো ওইখানে গেলাম একটা সাথে কাজ করেছে সুপারভাইজার একটা কাজে একটা কাজের জন্য বাংলাদেশি মধ্যে বিশ হাজার টাকা মতো হবে আর কি এওয়ার্ড পেয়েছে সেই এওয়ার্ডের টাকা আমাকে পাঠিয়ে দিচ্ছে আমাদের যারা কিছু করার চেষ্টা করে নো অ্যাপ্রিসিয়েশন উল্টাটা কিভাবে না করতে পারে সে ব্যবস্থা আমি <laughs> 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 আপনি কথাবার্তা বলেন কেন আপনি দেখেন একটা জায়গায় তখন আমি এব্রাম সোয়ার্জের একটা ফিলোসফিকাল বই ছিল সেখানে বইটাতে প্রথম ফরওয়ার্ডে লিখেছে ইউ হ্যাভ কট এ কাম পন্ড এটা পন্ড আছে কোনো ওয়েব নাই কিছু নাই নো উইন্ড দ্যাট ইউ সোসাইটি সোসাইটিকে এরকম ধরে নিয়েছে ইমাজিন করেছে দেন ইউ ইফ ইউ থ্রো এ স্মলেস্ট পিস অফ স্টোন এট ওয়ান কর্নার দ্যাট কর্নার উইল ডেভেলপ দ্য ওয়েব অ্যান্ড দ্যাট ওয়েব উইল রিচ টু ইচ অ্যান্ড এভরি কর্নার অফ দ্য পন্ড ইট মে টেক টাইম তো দ্যাট মিন্স স্টার্ট করা দিয়েছে কথা তারপরে এটা আস্তে আস্তে সব জায়গায় যাবে তো ঢাকা ইউনিভার্সিটি হচ্ছে ঢাকা ইউনিভার্সিটি প্রত্যেকটা ইউনিভার্সিটি অনুসরণ করে টোটো অল আইন কানুন যা আছে সব কিছু করে তো ঢাকা ইউনিভার্সিটি ক্যান টেক দ্য লিডিং ফর টু ডেভেলপ দ্য সোসাইটি আমার ধারণা আর কি এবং এটা দেখে অন্যান্য ইউনিভার্সিটিও সজাগ হবে আপনি তো ইউজিসি ছিলেন আপনি দেখেছেন আপনি নিজে অনেকগুলো ইউনিভার্সিটিকে নতুন ইউনিভার্সিটি স্টাবলিশ করেছেন তাই না আপনার আমল হয়েছে আমি তো গিয়ে বিভিন্ন জায়গায় গিয়েছি এই কনফারেন্স টনফারেন্স সেমিনার টেমিনার মধ্যে আমি দেখে আমার খুব খারাপ লেগেছে কোন ইউনিভার্সিটির একটা ডিপার্টমেন্টের একজন স্কলার নাই নট এ সিঙ্গেল ওয়ান কেমন নাই আপনি যদি সার্ভে করেন দেখবেন যে খায় দায় ঘুরে ফিরে পড়ায় এখন ওইখান থেকে তো আপনার গ্রেজুয়েট হয়ে আসতেছে 
তাই না এখন ঢাকা ইউনিভার্সিটি কয়জন গ্রাজুয়েট প্রস্তুত করতেছে অন্য ইউনিভার্সিটি পুরাতন ইউনিভার্সিটি ডিস ইউনিভার্সিটি কয়জন গ্রাজুয়েট তৈরি করতেছে বাকিগুলো তো তার চেয়ে বেশি করতেছে তো হোয়াট ইজ দ্য লেভেল অফ দোজ গ্রাজুয়েটস এন্ড দে উইল টেক দ্য চার্জ অফ দ্য সোসাইটি ইন ফিউচার এন্ড হোয়াট ইজ গোইং টু হ্যাপেন ইন ফিউচার টু দ্য ফিউচার জেনারেশন আমাদের চিন্তা করার দরকার না সরকারের উদ্দেশ্য ভালো কিন্তু এটাকে যারা চালাবে তাদের তো সেই মোটিভেশন থাকতে হবে সেই জন্য চেষ্টা করতে হবে সোয়েটিকে অ্যাওয়ার করতে হবে আমরা কিচ্ছু করতে পারছি না আমি আমারটাই করি আমি আমারটাই করি এইটা হচ্ছে এটা আমি যদি পাঁচ টাকা পেলাম পাবো কি না সেটার জন্য এমন ঘটনা ঘটেছে আপনার শুনে আশ্চর্য হবেন একটা এম ফিল কমিটির একটা ছাত্র সেই কমিটি আমি ইয়েছিলাম তো একটা ফার্স্ট পার্টে পরীক্ষা হয় এম ফিল ফার্স্ট ইয়ারে তো পরীক্ষা হবে একটা ছাত্র একজন ছাত্র ওই বছরে এখন যে নাকি কোর্স টিচার তিনি পরীক্ষা নেবেন কোর্স টিচারে নোটিস দেওয়া হয়েছে কিন্তু উনি আসলেন তাই নয় আমি ছিলাম আমি বললাম যে আমার একজন কলেজ ছিল বললাম যে আপনার পরীক্ষাটা নেন শেষ করে আমি ওই স্টার্ট এর মধ্যে আছি তো বললাম পরীক্ষাটা নেন আই থিং ওকে আই স্টার্ট টাইম ইজ রাইট নাও শেষ করে এক মিনিট এক মিনিট এক মিনিট এক মিনিট পরীক্ষাটা নেন তো নিয়েছে পরীক্ষা নিয়ে খাতাটা আমার কাছে দিয়ে দিয়েছে এখন দিনে এক্সামিন আমাকে বললাম যে আপনি আসছেন এত দেরি করে ঠিক আছে পরীক্ষাটা হয়ে গেছে আপনি পরীক্ষা করে দেখবেন এক্সামিন করে দেখবেন আমার সাথে ভীষণ রাগ কেন ওনার ডিউটিটা আমি একজন দিলাম কেন আমি বললাম যে মাফ চাই ওই ডিউটি যে পয়সা আছে সেটা আপনি দিব খাতাটা দেখেন খাতাটা না দেখা আপনার কোনো ক্ষমতা নেই দিতে হবে এটা হচ্ছে আমাদের মানসিকতা এই মানসিকতা থেকে আপনি কিভাবে উঠতে আসবেন যেন আপনি শুরু করেন প্লিজ ওকে Honorable Chief Guest, Respected President of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology, Eminent Keynote Speakers, Distinguished Scientists from Home and Abroad, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and very good evening to everyone. This is Dr. Muhammad Humayun Kabir, Secretary of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. I take a privilege to warmly welcome all of you to the International E-Conference on recent advances in biomathematics 2020. With the theme, biomathematics to combat the threats of mysterious pathogen. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very delighted and honored by the presence of Honorable President of Bangladesh Academy of Sciences, eminent scientist, Professor Emeritus, Dr. Ake Ajat Choudhury as the chief guest in this inaugural session. This session is chaired by the president of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology, Professor Dr. Ramot Haidar Ali Bishwas. Today, we feel truly honored and privileged to have a galaxy of eminent mathematical biologists from different corners of the world with us. Ladies and gentlemen, mathematics has been used in biology as early as the 12th century when Fibonacci used the Fibonacci series to describe a growing population of rabbits. Later on, in the 18th century, Neil Barnoli applied mathematics to describe the effect of smallpox on the human population. Thomas Malthus wrote a remarkable essay on the growth of the human population in 1689. That was based on the concept of exponential growth of population. Pierre Franquis Warhols formulated the logistic population growth model in 1836. Biomathematics aims at the mathematical representation and modeling of biological processes using techniques 
and tools of applied mathematics. And it can be useful in both the theoretical and practical research. Describing systems in a quantitative manner means their behavior can be better simulated. And hence, properties can be predicted that might not be evident to the experimenter. This requires precise mathematical models. Because of the complexity of the living systems, theoretical biology employs several fields of mathematics and has contributed to the development of new techniques. To promote theoretical approaches and mathematical tools in biology and medicine in Bangladesh, Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology, BSMB, has started its journey in 2020. To achieve the mission and vision of the society, BSMB organizes today's international e-conference on recent advances in biomathematics 2020. With this rightly chosen theme during COVID-19 pandemic, I now would like to request respected president of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology, B B Professor Dr. Muhammad Haider Ali Bishwas to deliver his welcome remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, respected president of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology, Professor Dr. Muhammad Haider Ali Bishwas. Sir, over Thank to you. you. Thank you, everybody. First of all, I would like to very warm welcome to all participants from home and abroad. And I am very much delighted to have our eminent, our eminent uh, chief guest, Professor Emeritus, Professor Eke Azad Choudhury. We are very much delighted because Professor Azad Choudhury is an eminent scientist in Bangladesh in, uh, and he likes actually the mathematics and its applications in everyday life. So I think over 20 countries from the globe, there are several participants, almost 800 participants are attending in this international conference. So we are very much delighted and we would like to very warm welcome to all the participants in this international forum. And we have seven eminent speakers from the USA, from UK, from the South Korean and Taiwan. So it will be a very great, a prestigious gathering, I think, on mathematics and its interface of biology and medicine. So we know that during the pandemic situation, we are very much restricted in our house. We cannot move in other palace in everywhere because of this pandemic. We are facing this pandemic our own year already passed and we hope a better a prevention and control strategy so that we can cure this pandemic situation very soon. Hopefully we could meet in the next coming year in a, a other several uh, scientific act activities in near future. So I would like to again thanks to our speakers who have accepted our invitation during this short invitation a time and all the delegates and our uh, colleagues from Bangladesh and all over the world who are attending and who have, who have accepted our invitation to share and to, uh, to share their views, knowledge in this uh, scientific gathering. So I am thankful to all the participants, all the eminent speakers and our respected guests and all other uh, our media partners uh, to broadcast the news and they to introduce our newly formed Society for Mathematical Biology. And I would like to thanks again, and hopefully everybody will enjoy, everybody will uh, 
share and we can have a better world using mathematics and its interface in biology and in medicine so thank you everybody and hopefully you will enjoy the our scientific session and we can share our views thank you everybody thank you sir thank you for your nice welcome remarks now i'd like to request eminent mathematician former ugc professor professor dr mohammad anwar hussain to say a few words ladies and gentlemen eminent mathematician prof ugc professor dr mohammad anwar hussain sir over to you ish eminent shabd ta use na korai bhalo excuse me just i will give a brief story about my visit to non spoken english countries china japan france germany wherever i i had been and i had the opportunity to give a talk there they never introduced me in english they first preferred their own language because they claim that their language is very rich but i don't think my language is so poor sorry we are we are dishonoring my language in my country tai ami bangla bolbo never mind ami prothome eta kothin kotha bole felo don't worry ami ekhon bangla e boli jodi dorkar hoy apnara interpret kore diben jara bangla jane na tader jonno ইংলিশে তো আমি যে দেশে গিয়েছি কোথাও আমি দেখি নাই যে আমাকে ইংলিশে ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে দিয়েছে চায়নায় গেছি চাইনিজ ভাষায় সেমিনার যে গেছে যখন গেছে বিদেশে গেছে চাইনিজ ইন্ট্রোডিউস করেছে জামাইতে গেছে সেখানে এক অবস্থা ফ্রান্সে গেছে সেখানে এক অবস্থা আমি ইংলিশে বলেছি কিন্তু ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে দেওয়া তা সে নিজে ভাষায় করেছে কেন সে নিজের ভাষাকে সম্মান করে আমি আমার ভাষা যদি ভালো জানি চেষ্টা করলে আমিও সে ভাষা অন্য ভাষায় একটা ভাষায় ভালো বলতে লিখতে পারি রবীন্দ্রনাথ ঠাকুর নিজের উপন্যাস নৌকা ডুবি নিজে অনুবাদ করেছে নিজে এবং সেই ভাষা কেউ হাত দিতে পারে নাই গীতাঞ্জলির কবিতা নিজে অনুবাদ করেছে কেউ করে দেয় নাই যদি অতটুক না পারা যাক নিজে জন্ম আমার করতে পারি আমার আগে আমার নিজের ভাষা যদি আমি জানি তাহলে অন্য ভাষা গ্রহণ করতে পারবো নেভার মাইন্ড যাই হোক তো আমার আমি খুব সৌভাগ্য যে আমাকে আজকে ডেকে ডেকে আনা হয়েছে হয়েছে কিছু কথা বলার জন্য কিছু বলার নাই আমি দেখছি যে একটা নতুন সোসাইটি আমি চাই না ब्लाड फ्लोर आलोचना मडलिंग हार्टे मध्य जो हार्ट एटैक जिन छात्र शुरू कर लोक जो तक मैथमेटिक्स কোন ম্যাথমেটিক্স কোথায় লাগবে এটা কেউ বলতে পারে না অ্যান্ড অল ম্যাথিক ম্যাথমেটিক্স থিওরিস ফর্মুলাস ম্যাথড সিস্টেম ডেভেলপড টু অ্যাপ্লাই ইন দ্য ফিজিক্যাল ওয়ার্ল্ড বায়োলজিক্যাল ওয়ার্ল্ড তো আমাকে আগে ম্যাথমেটিক্সটা জানতে হবে না জানলে আমি সেটা ব্যবহার জানব না ব্যবহার থেকে আমাকে পিক আপ করতে হবে এবং সেটা আবার ব্যবহারে যেতে হবে আমরা অনেকে থিওরি করি অনেক থিওরি করি কিন্তু যখন বলা একটা এক্সাম্পল দেন অ্যাপ্লিকেশনের তখন সে নাই মানে কোনো জবিত পায় না 
এই ধরনের ম্যাথামেটিক্স আমরা অনেকে করি ফিলোসফিক্যাল ডেভেলপমেন্টের জন্য হতে পারে অনেকে করেছে নো ম্যাথমেটিক্স ডেভেলপ উইদাউট সিং দি অ্যাপ্লিকেশন ইন দ্য সোসাইটি সো এর থেকে প্রবলেমটি এসছে এবং তার থেকে ম্যাথমেটিক্স ডেভেলপ করেছে সেটা আমরা কখনো দেখি না ইভেন আমিও দেখি না এখানে যারা আছে তারা কয়েকজন দেখেছে আমি জানি না আমিও দেখি না তাই আমাকে ম্যাথমেটিক্যাল বায়োলজি বলতে কি বুঝি ওর ম্যাথমেটিক্স ফর বায়োলজি কোনটা ওর বায়ো ম্যাথমেটিক্স ইন বায়োলজি কোনটা কোনটা ঠিক হবে ম্যাথমেটিক্যাল বায়োলজি হবে না ম্যাথমেটিক্স ইন বায়োলজি হবে ওর ম্যাথমেটিক্স ফর বায়োলজি কোনটা হবে এটা আমাকে ভাবতে হবে তাহলে আমার ম্যাথমেটিক্সের লোকজন বায়োলজি বায়োলজি বা বায়োলজিতে যে ব্যবহারটা হয় সেটা আমি দেখাতে পারি আমি যদি এখন জিজ্ঞেস করি একটা প্ল্যান্ট প্ল্যান্ট কিভাবে প্ল্যান্টের পানিটা প্ল্যান্টের পানি আপডেট করে ফর্ম সয়েল সে কিভাবে উপর দিকে উঠে কিভাবে উঠে কিভাবে ফাংশনটা করে ওই সয়েল থেকে পানি না গেলে উপরে না উঠলে সে প্ল্যানটা বাঁচবে না সিরিয়াস ম্যাথামেটিক্স তো এটাও আমি জানি না বালো দেখে চান যারা পড়ে তারা এনে আলোচনা করে কিনা তো এখানে ম্যাথামেটিক্যাল এক্সপ্রেশন আছে আমি অনেক ধরনের একটা থিসি দেখেছিলাম ইন্ডিয়ার থেকে একজন পাঠিয়েছিল এই ধরনের মডেল নিয়ে কিভাবে করে দ্যাট মিনস এভরি হ্যার দেয় ইজি ম্যাথামেটিক্স অ্যান্ড হুইচ ম্যাথামেটিক্স অ্যাপ্রোপ্রিয়েট ফর দ্য সিচুয়েশন আমাকে সেটা গ্রহণ করতে পারলে খুঁজতে পারলে আমার ম্যাথমেটিক্সের অ্যাপ্লিকেশন অনেক দেখাতে পারি এনিওয়ে তো আপনাদের এই সাফল্য সাকসেসফুল হোক সেটা আমি আশা করো বিদেশের থেকে অনেকে আছেন স্পিকার আছেন আমি আমি জানি ওনারা আমাদের কাছ থেকে কিছু পারবেন না হয়তো আমরা ওনাদের কাছ থেকে কিছু পাবো কেমন এই আশা রেখেই আমার বক্তব্য শেষ করছি থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ Thank you, sir, for your nice speech. Ladies and gentlemen, now may I request the Honorable Chief Guest, President Bangladesh Academy of Sciences, eminent scientist, Professor Emeritus, Dr. A.K. Ajat Chaudhuri, to deliver his address and open the International League Conference on Recent Advances in Biomathematics 2020. Professor Chaudhuri has a, a remarkable contribution in science, particularly pharmacology. And Professor Chaudhuri served as the Chairman of the University Grants Commission of Bangladesh and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Dhaka. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Emeritus, Dr. A.K. Ajat Chaudhuri. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am here to learn and to know what is about the mathematical biology. As Dr. Anwarshan said, what should be the exact terminology? Should it be the biology of mathematics or mathematics for biology or mathematics for solving the problems of life sciences? Life is a very complex process. It is intricately complex. Like other physical sciences, it has to be solved and sorted out. We in pharmacology or biology or pharmacy try to understand the life process and living process through experimentation. But this experimentation are not always a perfect. This experimentation also are based on certain principle, certain logistic, certain expression and factor. What is that is there comes math. Nothing is outside the math, you know. Starting from philosophy, world in non philosopher, the, when the, the very civilization hasn't evolved yet, there too, if you talk about Plato's school, 2000 years back, Plato's school, they used to teach mathematics, you know. They used to interpret things in mathematical terms. If you go to Aristotle, Aristotle also did the same thing. Plato did the same thing. All the uh, Athens politician philosopher, they used to use this maths 
for extending their knowledge. If you think about economics, that's most of the cases economists are philosopher and they interpret their science in mathematics. So mathematics is the language of science, language of civilization, language of understanding and expressing the thing, which may be very helpful for the people. I can recall roughly about 30 years back, well, my wife was doing PhD in Manchester in biology field, you know. I was doing my PhD in chemistry, that is designing of anti-cancer drug, synthesis of anti-cancer drug, and study of anti-cancer drug. So two things are different. She is doing on biology. I'm trying to understand chemistry and molecular buses of action. But her one is very interesting. He was trying to interpret life Buckley. through equation. Buckley. I still remember Buckley. that was one butterfly Buckley. equation. You might know one butterfly equation maybe a Look. beginning for you. But for me, it was so many factors integrated in an equation to explain life. Why? It sometimes goes fast, sometimes goes slow. Sometimes goes faster even than at the end of life is ceased. All these explanations of activities of life, including disease, including prevention, vaccine, drug, philosophy, food habit, color, politics, everything is explained in terms of equation. And that multidimensional factors only mathematician can really handle. So without mathematics, nothing can go. For biology, they should also have mathematics. Unfortunately, globally it is true, those who prefer biology are afraid of maths. But now without having a maths, you can't study biology or for that matter, any science. So in America, STEM system, STEM. STEM is the common things they stress. Science, technology, and maths, and three things are integrated into one. This biomathematics is a new uh, terminology. It's not a new terminology, it's an old terminology, but I'm glad that in Bangladesh, a brilliant scientist like the people we see here are giving, putting their head together to solve out the problems of life in terms of mathematical equation and give a solution to the society to this civilization. I'm really honored to be here as an audience here. I don't have the capacity or I don't have the wisdom or sagacity to be the chief guest, but I can only say that I've got a profound regard for the mathematician solving problems of life, solving problem of universe, solving solving of the chemistry or in wave mechanics, whatever it is. It is mathematics who can really show us light for solving our problem. About the COVID, when the COVID came up, there were a lot of question and answer and interpretation. Can we really solve the COVID using A1, artificial intelligence one? Means artificial intelligence has multiverse factor. It can be used for disastrous thing or it can be used for benefit of mankind. They were trying to solve out how COVID could be handled using artificial intelligence. So the thing is that the mathematics will solve or way out how this pandemic can be controlled and used. Even the vaccine, we talk about the vaccine. So many factors, the body reaction, environment, temperature, reaction with the with the body system. So many factors have to be taken into account to make a vaccine effective and harmless, but effective. That is also a sorting out a straight line in a complex world. That also mathematics can solve this problem. Out this few words, I take the privilege to declare this international conference open and I am looking forward to, to the mathematician, 
to solve the global problem, to solve the problem of life, to solve the problem of biology as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your valuable speech and opening the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, it's my privilege to welcome all to the International E-Conference on Recent Advances in Biomathematics. This is the end of our inaugural session. Now the scientific session will start very soon. The scientific session started at 7.35 in the same Zoom thing. Thank you so much for staying with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite you all to attend the scientific session. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Kobish. We'll meet again. But Thank I like you. Professor to this talk. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really. Ladies and gentlemen, our first scientific session will start 7.35. The speaker of the first scientific session is Professor Chin Chuan Chen, he's from National Taiwan University, Taiwan. And he will talk on traveling web solutions of a free boundary problem with latent defect. So we'll start our scientific session very soon. Thank you for staying with us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> You are free to choose whatever you want. Thank you so much, sir. So thank you. Hey, Amitali, join okay. Nice talk, sir. <laughs> Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for your nice speech. We really, we really enjoyed a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I go a bit because I have so many things to do? Should, should you want me to stay? If possible, sir, please stay with us. If, if you, I want to hear the first okay. speech. One, okay. you know. It's, it's yeah. our great pleasure. If you stay with us. Maybe, After that, uh, I have to give you the right of what I would request <laughs> you to say. <send. laughs> Sorry, you can just uh, uh, put off your, I mean, camera off and then you can program, just sorry. relax and then you can listen to us yes. as well as because you are yes, giving sir, a yes, very sir. important time yes. and I think you have also uh, other important things to do, but you can... Uh, I mean, you can hear the uh, the next session, and I think if the chair allows, yeah, we should. We yes, should, uh, yeah. yes it's all right. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's okay, sir. Aza Chaudhary, sir, uh, honorable uh, chief guest, sir. If you want, you can just uh, I think uh, helps some cup of tea and then just uh, I've got so, so many things to I'll write at home. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sir. Thank yeah. you. Wish you best of luck and everything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for our uh, uh, for giving us your company and you give a valuable species. Actually, the topics is very much relevant. Your species is very much relevant to our uh, greater audience because Biology, mathematics, and medicine is a very interconnected topics in the a global a perspective. So your speech is very uh, inspiration, I think, for the young talent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. I beg leave of you then. Okay, sir. Professor Chin Chuan Chen, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Could you could you please turn on your camera, Professor Chin Chuan Chen? Okay. Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 You're I do. It's it, it's it's my great pleasure to see you after a long time. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure too. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, Pro- Professor Usman Goni, can you hear me? I think uh, we can start. Yes, yes. Professor Haider Ali, yes, us, shall we start? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I think, I think we can start at 730. We don't, we don't need to wait for the 735. I think we can start now. Okay, okay. So, okay, ladies, Goni, okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the scientific session of International Conference on Recent Advances in Biomathematics. So this is the first session, and the speaker of this session is Professor Dr. Chin Chuan Chen. So I have a very long relation with Professor Chin Chuan Chen. We met several times in Japan, in Taiwan, in, in many conferences. And uh, basically, we met several times in Meiji University when I was a PhD student in Japan. So it is really a great honor for me to welcome Professor Chin Chuan Chen to this international conference. And on my personal behalf and on behalf of the society, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to Professor Chin Chuan Chen to accept our invitation and to give his kind consent to give a keynote talk in this conference. So this session is chaired by Professor Dr. Mohammed Usman Guni, Jahanginagar University, Bangladesh. Professor Usman Guni is the vice president of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. Now I'd like to request Professor Dr. Mohammed Usman Guni to conduct this session. Thank you. Now over to Professor Dr. Mohammed Usman Guni. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Humayun Kabir. Um, let's start our session. Can you hear me all, please, Dr. Kabir? Yes, can yes. You hear me? yes, we can hear you. It is loud and clear. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to the first scientific session of International E-Conference on Recent Advances in Biomathematics 2020. As you know, this conference is organized by Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. And the keynote speaker of this session is Professor Dr. Chiun Chuan Chen. Department of Mathematics, National Taiwan University. The title of his talk is Traveling Web Solutions of a Free Boundary Problem with Latent Heat Effect. And I am also feel lucky to be a chair of this session because I also met several times with Professor Chen in Japan and Taiwan at the Japan-Taiwan meeting during my PhD study. So before starting, I would like to say a few words about Professor Chun Chuan Chen. Dr. Chen is currently a professor of mathematics at National Taiwan University. He obtained his PhD in mathematics from National Taiwan University and held academic positions at Academic Sinica and National Chung Cheng University. Professor Chiun Chuan is also actively serving at the Institute of Applied Mathematical Science at National Taiwan University. His research interests include elliptic equations, reaction diffusion equations, and calculus of variations. His research emphasizes qualitative behavior of solutions of nonlinear PDEs related to biological problems. Professor Chen has been serving in numerous editorial boards. He has given many lecture series all over the world. He has also written several very well received expository papers and monographs. So, Professor Chen, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you after a long time. Yes, now nice to see you. I would like to request Professor Tiun Chuan Chen to present his keynote speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Tiun Chuan Chen, please start. Okay. Let me Thank share you. my slide. So, can you see my slide? No? Not yet. Uh, yet.
How about now? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, okay. We can see your slide. Sorry. This one is the correct one. So uh, thank you, Chairman, Professor Ghani, and uh, Professor Carper. So first, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially Professor Carper, for the kind invitation and uh, great organization of this conference. I first uh, met uh, Professor uh, Kapper maybe in Japan, I think, then in Taiwan, then in Japan again. Also, I met Professor Ghani uh, several times. So it's really a uh, uh, wonderful thing that we can meet each other in uh, Bangladesh, in a sense, online. This is a great opportunity. especially during this uh, pan pandemic uh, period. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to consider uh, train wave solutions of a free, free boundary problem with latent heat effect. So here is the outline of my talk. So there are many three parts. So in part one, I first will introduce uh, the Mimura Yamada Yostani competition model with a free boundary. So this is a model for two competitive uh, species. Then I will consider the one species case. And after that, uh, I will discuss uh, the relation between the asymptotic behavior of this parabolic system and the corresponding train wave solutions. And then I will show you an existence result of two species train wave with a free boundary. So this is for, these are for part one. And in part two, uh, I will introduce you an approximation of two species Stefan problem by using a reaction diffusion system. Then by using this uh, approximation, uh, the latent heat if effect will be introduced into the Stefan problem. So with this latent heat effect, we will look at the MYY model again and uh, consider the related train wave solutions. So I will prove the existence of the train wave and uh, give some speed estimate depend on the so-called balance quantity. So I will introduce this quantity later. Then in part three, I will use another approach the, the variational characterization for the speed C naught, which is the speed when the latent heat vanishes. Then finally, I will give some uh, conclusion remarks. So this is the outline. So first, let me introduce the MYY composition model. So in a paper, Mimura, Yamada, and uh, Yostani, they proposed a free boundary problem to study segregation and uh, aggregation of biological individuals. So they consider the one dimensional domain. So the domain is a closed interval from zero to zero. And the P and the Q are the density of two species occupying the region zero to S of T and the region from S of T to L respectively. 
So this is a typical profile. So this is our domain. And uh, in the domain, there is a point. It is a free boundary point, S of T. And uh, the species P occupies the left hand side. And uh, the species Q occupies the right hand side region. So this is a typical profile of uh, these two species. And uh, in their own region, so the P species satisfy a Fisher KPP type equation like this. And uh, also Q satisfy a KPP Fisher equation like this. And at fr the free boundary, they proposed such a Stefan type boundary condition. So S of T denote the location of the free boundary. And at this point, the value of P and also the value of Q are equal to zero. And the movement of the free boundary point is uh, characterized by the combination of the derivative of P and uh, Q. So this is a linear combination of P sub X and Q sub X, X. So in this picture, you can see the derivative P sub X should be negative. This is a typical situation. So this is negative and uh, the first term altogether becomes positive. And uh, for the second term in this situation, at the free bound point, the derivative of Q should be positive. So for the second term, we have a negative sign. So we have a positive sign here and a negative sign here. So this is a competition. This indicates the competition between P and Q. And uh, also they propose some uh, directed boundary condition at this point, also at this point. So this is their model. So the main uh, purpose to propose this model is to study the seg segregation and the aggregation phenomena. So before we go further, so let me uh, show you one species model first. So let's consider the simplest but very important model, the Fisher KPP equation. So again, U is the density of a uh, uh, biological species. So we have the part for the uh, diffusion here and the nonlinear term to describe the growth of the species. So when one consider this Fisher KPP equation on the entire real line, then important solutions are, uh, say, traveling waves. So if one consider uh, initial data U note with compact support, support, then one can observe the propagation of the species. So this model is very nice. However, it has some shortcomings. For example, if we assume that the initial data, initial population is non-negative and there is positive somewhere, then immediately the solution will become positive everywhere. So this means that a small portion of the population can propagate with a very large speed. So this is not uh, reasonable. So this is one shortcoming. So another shortcoming uh, is like this. Say, if we assume that the initial population is very small, but according to this equation, it is easy to see that the species still can 
spread successfully. So this seems not fit the experimental data uh, in biology. So to overcome these uh, shortcomings, do and lean and do and grow proposed the following problem with a free boundary to study the spreading phenomena of an invasive species. So in their system, there is only one species U. Again, it satisfies the KPP Fisher equation, but only on a bounded region. So the space variable is between zero and the sun point S of T. So again, S of T is a free boundary point. So at this free boundary point, they assume such a Stefan type free boundary condition. So the movement, the movement rate of the free boundary point S of t is equal to some constant times the derivative of u at that point, and uh, they put a minus sign here. So you can see this boundary condition is actually similar to the one in the MYY model. So their boundary condition is like this. They have they have two species. If you remove the Q species, then the condition is the same as the one proposed by Du and Li, and also Du and Guo. And they found that if they assume that U is the density of the invasive species, and assume that initially the population of U uh, is uh, bounded, is located on a boundary region, then they can prove a very interesting spreading vanishing dichotomy. So after uh, doing some scaling, we may assume that the coefficients in the system are all to be one. So under this situation, they prove that Say, if the support of the initial population is between zero and S naught, so S naught denotes the size of the support of the initial population. So if S naught is greater than pi over two, then they show that regardless of the initial population size, spreading always happens. And uh, if the initial support size S0 is less than pi over 2, then spreading or vanishing is determined by the initial population size U0 and also by the coefficient mu in the Stefan boundary condition. So one can see that the solution behavior is quite different from the solution behavior of the Fisher KPP equations. So if one put in a free boundary into the model, then one may get new interesting phenomena. So this is a one species situation. And uh, also to and Lin prove that when spreading occurs, then the free boundary S of T asymptotically moves with a uh, speed C. So that is S of T has this asymptotic behavior. So roughly speaking, uh, the speed of S of T looks like C, especially when T is very large. And uh, how to determine this speed C? They show that this speed C can be de determined by the Turing wave solution on a half domain of the following equation. So again, we have the feature KPP equation, but in the form of 
Turing wave. So a solution satisfies this equation can represent a turning wave with speed c. But in this situation, the turning wave only survives on a half domain from minus infinity to zero. And actually, zero uh, represents the free boundary S of t after some translation. And also, it satisfies some suitable boundary condition at infinity and uh, at zero. And uh, also, they have condition on the derivative. It is determined by mu and the speed, where again, mu is the coefficient appear in the Stefan boundary condition. So from their result, we know that turning wave solutions on a half domain is very important for the asymptotic behavior. So let's come back to the uh, Mimura Yamada Yostani model. So again, we can do some suitable scaling to make most of the coefficients in the system to be one. And uh, consider corresponding Turing wave solution. So in this case, the right system for the Turing wave should be looked like this. So for one species, it uh, should satisfy a Turing wave equation on the left-hand side. And uh, for the other species, it should uh, satisfy a Turing wave equation also on a half domain. And uh, at the free boundary point, uh, we have the value that u equals zero and also v equals zero. And uh, also we have suitable boundary condition at minus infinity. And uh, now the Stefan boundary condition become like this. So here C is the wave speed and uh, here is the combination of the derivative of the, uh, the solution U and V. So this is a corresponding Stefan boundary condition. And uh, one good thing is that uh, Young proved that actually this, this, this traveling wave system can determine the asymptotic behavior of the MYY system on the entire domain R if the initial values are given suitably. So this is a good thing. So his results also indicate that to study this train wave system is very important. So let me show you an earlier work uh, by uh, Jiaxin Zhang and myself about the existence of the train wave for this system. So I uh, forgot to mention that uh, this talk is a journal work uh, with Jue uh, Xin Zhang and uh, Zhu Chang Huang. So in the early uh, uh, paper, we showed that, assume that the coefficient in the MYY system are positive then there exists a unique two-speed turning wave solution with speed c equals to sun c star. So we can prove that the existence and the uniqueness of such a system. And uh, also we can get some estimate for the wave speed c star. So actually, the, this C star is close related to the uh, minimal speed of the KPP Fisher equation. So let me use C minima, C mean U to denote the minimal speed of the train wave solution for the KPP Fisher equation on the entire real line. 
and uh, let C mean V to denote the minimal speed of the train wave for this KPP equation on the entire domain. So a typical profile for the solution U looks like this. So for this solution U, there is no free bounding point. And uh, the profile for V is similar, but the profile for V is more time increasing. And our results show that for the two species system, for the MYY system, there is corresponding turn wave looks like this. So there is a free bound point at here. And uh, it is not difficult to show that the wave speed of this two species wave C star is lines, uh, lines between C mean V and the C mean U. That means that we can use this minimal speed to bound the train wave speed of the two species system. So this is uh, one of our results. And uh, there are uh, more recent uh, progress on related problems include uh, Young Rowe proves the existence of three species wave with free boundary. Also, Young study a time period comp competitive system with a free boundary. And Du and Wu investigate spreading phenomena with two speeds. And uh, the Du and uh, his group also study the high di higher dimensional problems and also non local diffusion models with free boundaries. So there are uh, too many literatures. So the reference mentioned in this talk are far from complete. So I'm very sorry for this. So next, uh, let's consider another approach. Uh, to study the MYY. In a paper by here host Ida, Mimura, and uh, Niomiya, they consider the following problem. Say, first, if you have a system with a free boundary, and uh, uh, what in their mind is uh, to think that if one can replace the system with a free boundary by a system without free boundaries. Or at least we can approach, approach the problem with a free boundary with a system without free boundaries. That is their question. So they propose such a system. So actually this is a competition system of U and V. So again, we have the Fisher KPB term here and also here. And uh, this term denotes the competition between U and V. So we assume that epsilon and alpha one are all positive. And this term denotes the competition between U and V again. So they show that if Epsilon tends to zero. That means the coefficient of this term become larger and larger. So that means the competition becomes very strong. So under such situation, they can show that the solution will tend to some function u and v in L2 sense. And uh, they also show that u times v equals zero almost everywhere. That means U and V segregate with each other. Furthermore, they point out that if we consider the, the region on which U is positive and also the, the region on which V is positive. So if one point is belong to both of uh, belong 
to the boundary of both of these two regions, then it is a free bound point. And uh, this, at this point, they show that it satisfies such a free boundary uh, condition like this. And uh, if you compare this condition to the second condition in MYY model, which looks like this, and you can see the difference is that for their condition, there is no S prime of T. So this approximation cannot recover MYY model. Therefore, they consider another system of three species. So now we have an equation for W also. And uh, we have additional two terms here. So this term denotes the competition between U and uh, one minus W. And this term denotes V, the competition between V and uh, W. And uh, in the equation of W, there is no diffusion term. And also we have some interaction term like this. Then they show that for this system, if you one less the epsilon tends to zero, that means the completion in these terms become very strong. Then the free bounding condition will become like this. So if uh, you let lambda to be one here, then this condition recover the Stefan condition in MYY model. And actually, this condition is similar to the Stefan condition in the melting process of ice in contact with water with latent heat lambda. So this is why we call the, it uh, the latent heat effect. Then a related question is that, what is the biological meaning of this three species system? And what is the biological meaning of this approximation? So in their paper, they also show that when the competition becomes very strong, the third species will tend to one on the domain where U is positive and it will tend to zero on the domain where V is positive. Therefore, we can say that when epsilon is small, it can impact the species U. And uh, the function one minus W as a characteristic function indicating the habit of V. So with this, so let me quote one paragraph in their paper. They said that in their model, there are two different types of interaction between U and V. One is a directly competitive interaction due to the term U times V. So let me show you again. This term appear here and here. And uh, this competition interaction is for obtaining their common resource, say like uh, food. And uh, the other is a structuring interaction two terms, then we use these two terms. And uh, this interaction which represent constructing is for their, for constructing their own before these two terms. you attack the coefficients before you attack the habitat of V. 
So according to their idea, they one is the competition for common resource. One is the competition for more complicated habitats. And uh, the latent heat lambda here indicate the strength for the second competition. So they give such an explanation for their model. So with their ideas, so we consider the MYY model again, but with latent heat effect, and also consider the related turning wave system. So here is again the system, but we have latent heat lambda here. And this again, the corresponding train wave system. And we again, we have potential lambda here. And our first question is that, can we prove the existence and the uniqueness of the train wave solution for this new system? And the answer is yes. We can show that there exist a unique train wave solutions with some speed denoted by C lambda, the latent heat. Then we can obtain similar uh, result and a similar estimate for the, the uh, speed theorem. I, I, I didn't uh, mention clearly the estimate. The estimate actually have three different situation. If this quantity is positive, then the speed is positive and is bounded by this number. Again, two here is the minima speed. And uh, if this quantity is zero, then the speed is zero. And if this quantity is negative, then we have this kind of uh, low bound. So we can see that this quantity, the sign of it determines the sign of the speed. And the similar situation happens in our new series. So this is the same quantity. If uh, alpha one is bigger, then the speed is bigger. And alpha one is negative, then the speed is negative. And uh, the different things that we have learned that here. And actually we can uh, prove this by the same method, method as the previous theorem. So it's, this is not too new, at least from the point of uh, mathematical method. But the interesting thing that actually we can show that the speed C lambda is strictly decreasing in lambda when it is positive. And uh, when it is negative, then this speed is strictly increasing in lambda. So if we take the absolute value of the speed, so actually this result shows that the absolute value of the speed is decreasing in lambda. So that means the latent heat reduce the wave speed. And uh, when the latent heat becomes zero, the value of the speed becomes its maxima. And uh, sorry. The second remark is that in these two theorem, we can see that there is a balance condition, this quantity. If this quantity is zero, then the speed is zero. So the sign of this quantity determines the sign of the wave speed. So let's call this quantity the balance uh, quantity. Now, uh, that let me just uh, uh, give you a very brief idea. So first, uh, how to prove the theorem? First, we let P denote the derivative of 
u. So p equals u prime. Then the equation be, uh, because there is question. I see someone has question. So, so maybe not. So this is the second derivative of u, and this is the first derivative of u. And for the equation v, if we let q uh, be the derivative of v, then we have this equation. And uh, the standard method is that to consider the function p as a function of u, not a function of x. So we consider the function q as a, so with this equation by this new equation. So this is the equation for P with re respect to the variable U. And this is the equation for Q with respect to the variable V. And then this, again, the Stefan condition looks like this. And uh, we can follow the similar uh, argument of theorem A to prove this theorem. So I just skip it. Now the speed is uh, monotone in the Leighton heat. So that's G of C to be the right hand side of our Stefano condition. So the right hand side is here. So the problem is reduced to find C such that the Stefan condition like this, which can hold. So our goal is to find C to solve this identity. And uh, first, it is easy to show that when we consider the minimum speed of the KPP equation, then we have this uh, relation. So this is easy to verify. And uh, from the standard argument, we can show that P is ne always negative and uh, is increasing in C. Q is always positive and uh, is increasing in C. So we put this into G of C, then we know that since we have negative sign here, so we know C, G of C is strictly decreasing in C. And uh, also this minimum speed of V is negative, this minimum speed of U is uh, positive. So we can, we can find that g of c minima u equals this quantity. But when we put minima into p, it is zero. So we only have the term for q here. And uh, use the monotonicity of q, we know that this quantity is less than this one. But this one is zero, as we mentioned here. So we know this is negative. And similarly, we can show this is positive. So with these facts, so here I did uh, facts just mentioned. So this quantity is so we consider the value g of zero. So the first is the case g of zero is positive and equal zero and is negative. So let's only consider the first case because the other two are the similar. Decrease it. Now we draw the line y by this Stefan condition. So once we find the intersection point, then we solve our problem and we can show there exists a turn well. So this point, the first 
co 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 coordinate of this intersection point is the speed c lambda. So you can see that when lambda become larger and larger, the slope of the line become bigger and bigger, and the, the intersection point will go this way, and the, the web, web speed, the scale of the speed will become smaller and smaller. So this is why we can show that the absolute value is decreasing in lambda. So it's the main idea. So due to the limit of time, so let me turn to uh, another estimate. So as mentioned that the sign of this quantity coincides with the sign of the speed. So therefore it is nature to ask the question. So can we get some estimate for the speed C so that the estimate also depends on the, this quantity. So here is our result. We can show that, yes, the speed C is bounded by this, these two quantities when this si the sign of it is positive and when it is negative, we have a similar result. And when this is zero, then the speed is zero. So the interesting thing is that the data and the heat appear here and also appear here. So from this estimate, of time that the asymptotic has lambda 10 to infinity. So as lambda to 10 to infinity, this speed tends to zero and uh, this result tell you the uh, exact uh, 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 asymptotic behavior. So this is our new estimate for the speed. So uh, the rough idea to prove the theorem is as follows. So we consider the case when C equals zero, when the speed equals zero. And we try to calculate the quantity g of zero. So let me remind you that g of c is a quantity. This is the right hand side of the Stefan boundary condition. So first we try to calculate the value of g of zero. Then when the speed c is zero, then the equation for P reduced to this simple one. So we can actually to find that it has this solution. And also for the equation of Q, we can also obtain the exact solution for it. Therefore, we, we find that we can find the value of G of zero is like this. So you can see that actually this quantity is the so-called balance quantity appear here, the same one. So the first step, and then we uh, would like to know the change rate of G of C as C varies. So we can see the derivative of uh, P with re respect to C and, and denote it by sigma. And also we consider that C denoted by tau. And uh, after some calculation, we can show that the change rate of P is less than one, and the change rate of Q is less than this quantity. Therefore, G prime of C can be estimated by these two quantities, like this. Now, for simplicity, uh, let me assume that this quantity is positive. Sorry, I think uh, there, sorry. The G of zero should be this quantity, not this one. 
And uh, now we can start capital G equals, we let capital G uh, equal to lambda C minus G of C. So as you know that if lambda C equals G of C, then this is our Stefan, Stefan boundary condition. So that means if capital G equals it zero, then we can find a solution. And we know that when we put in the solution speed, then the capital G becomes zero because this means that this C lambda satisfies the Stefan boundary condition. Then we can use some uh, basic integral estimate and, uh, like this. And uh, here, of course, capital G prime includes the derivative G prime. And uh, since we have get some estimate for G prime, so we can get some nice estimate. So this is the main idea. So the last part is about the variational approach. So as you can see that uh, in, oh, sorry, not this one. Yes, uh, this one. So in, in this result, if lambda is small, the estimate seems not good. So we are curious about the estimate when lambda is small. Then we found that it is difficult to estimate the speed when lambda is small. However, at least we would like to know or to get some estimate for the so that we can find the variation characterization for our problem. So here is the idea. So uh, actually this, this method is developed by Hans and also by the group, uh, Lucia Muratov and uh, uh, Novaka for gradient system. And uh, more recently with my collaborators, we can generalize their ideas to uh, physical Nakamo system. So now let H denote the nonlinear term for U and uh, uh, nonlinear term in the equation for U and uh, K denotes the nonlinear term for the equation uh, of V. And uh, consider this nonlinear function. Actually, this nonlinear function is uh, obtained from this nonlinear term H and K. So the F prime actually equals minus H here. When W is positive, we have this relation. And uh, when, when W is negative, F prime equals, sorry, we should have a minus here also. F prime equals minus K of V with some scaling. Yeah. So basically, we obtain this capital F from this nonlinear term H and uh, K. Then with this capital F, we can find a variation characterization. So first we consider the local two local minima of this capital F. It's easy to calculate that the local minima of F are this one and uh, this one. This is the local minima points. Now, for this W1 or W2, we consider the solid space H. So Wi denotes W1 or W2. And uh, this function eta uh, is a solid function with this weighted norm, we have an exponential here. And with, with this weighted norm, we also supply space. That is, we normalize the derivative 
under the weight exponential. So B is the subspace of H with this constraint. Then we can consider this quantity. So again, capital F is given by this, and we have weight known here, and consider the inf over the space B and uh, get uh, infima, which is not it by mu C. But characterize the west speed denoted by C naught, and we can show that C not equal square root of mu c. So when this quantity is positive, we know that c not is related to mu sub c. And uh, we have two here. So two means that we put i to be two. So that means we use w2 as, as the best point and uh, obtain mu c2. So when this is positive, we consider mu c2 and uh, find that the speed is square root of this mu c2. And when this quantity is negative, then we use mu c1. So this is a variation calculation. And uh, an application to use this formula is like this. So we put some... <laughs> So we put some test function in our variation characterization so we can obtain that when this quantity is positive and we consider this function looks a little bit complicated. So it is a, a function of S and here we have S square and also we have some exponent function of S. So we consider this function K1 of S Then we obtain this estimate. We can obtain a low bound of the C naught. So the low bound is that the square root of maxima of this K1. So similarly, we can obtain a upper bound for the C naught when C naught is negative. So this is a variational characterization. And uh, uh, the, the proof is a little bit complicated, but let me show you uh, some idea. So, say U and V are the traveling wave solutions with C equals C naught. So, when the space variable is, uh, is less than zero, we denote W to be U. And uh, when z is positive, we denote w to be v bar. So v bar is a scaling of our solution v. So with this um, notation, we can show that the function w actually satisfy a nice equation, where the nonlinear term is that look like this. So this part comes comes from the equation of u, and this part comes from the equation of v. And uh, and uh, this nonlinear term has ha has two roots, one and uh, uh, this number. Then the solution is actually denotes a turing wave solution, which connects the steady state W one and W two. Now we consider the primitive of the nonlinear function f. The small f is again is this one, and uh, we can see the negative of its antiderivative. Then we can consider such a variational energy. So we have a nonlinear term capital F appear here, and uh, this is a, a gradient term for the test function, and also we have weight exponent z here and uh, consider this on the 
space we mentioned before. Then, actually, you can show that our solution W is a minimizer of the our variational problem. So we denote the infima of the energy to be mu c. So the question is that we give a c, then we form this energy, and we can check that actually the the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation satisfy our uh, equation. But the problem is how to determine C in advance. So by lemma due to Hans and uh, the group of uh, Lucia Muratov and no Novaka, they can show that if WC naught is a, the solution, then the energy of it equals zero. So this is a necessary condition. So therefore, we are looking for the speed C naught such that the infima equals zero. So let's calculate the infima. It looks like this. And we can show that actually C appear only here. This is, is nothing to do with C. So it is an increasing function of C. So then we show we can see that mu C is strictly increasing in C. And also we can show that mu C is positive when C is large and is negative when C is close to zero. So between small C and large C, there is exact one C which satisfies this condition. This is how we dis uh, determine the speed. So this is the main idea to obtain our variation characterization. And uh, the proof of it's a, the query just uh, find some nice uh, test function. So let me uh, make uh, some remarks of uh, our talk. So the first one is that several type free boundary problems can avoid the shortcomings of uh, Fisher KPP model. This uh, has shown by Du Lin Guo Yamada Yostani in their model, and actually in the later work by the group of Nimura, they propose that there are two levels of interaction between U and V mm -hmm. when the latent heat is not zero. So one level is the direct competition interaction for obtaining their common resource. The other is the structural interaction for constructing their own habitats, where the latent heat indicates the cost rate when one attacks the habitat of the other. So this uh, uh, is their nice ideas. And uh, we show that the latent heat, heat actually retards the propagation of turning wave of the Stefan problem. The speed tends to zero with the order one over lambda when the latent heat lambda tends to infinity. And uh, also we obtain another estimate for the uh, wave speed with latent heat, which depends on the balance quantity. And finally, we obtain uh, some variational characterization for the wave speed when the latent heat is uh, when the latent heat vanishes. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chin Chuan Cheng, for your nice talk. Now uh, we have three to four minutes for question and succession. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Kubit to conduct question and succession within five minutes. Please try to stop this session with, within five minutes. Okay, thank you, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Usman. I have received a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Farhan asked, uh, can you please explain the Stefan free boundary conditions? Uh, free boundary conditions. Yes, uh, actually, I, I did a show. 
my slide. Uh, let me see. But uh, uh, let me, uh, sorry. Let me use the model proposed by the group of Mimura. So the latent heat appears, W is actually 10 to one. So W is like some kind of characteristic function. So according to their idea, it's better to consider W as the indicator function of the habitat of the species. So W means the habitat of U, and one minus W means the habitat of V. So this means the competition of U with the habitat of V. And the, the latent heat lambda here is denotes some uh, strength factor uh, to describe the competition. Yeah. So this is a biological uh, meaning yeah, proposed by them. Okay, can you do the next question? Dr. Professor Chin Chuan Chen, can you hear me? Uh, yes. So, could you say again uh, what next is the question next is question? The moving boundary, the moving boundary S, uh, does it asymptotically move with the constant speed? This question was asked by Ariful Islam, Mr. Ariful Islam. Uh, the moving boundary, does it asymptotically yes, move? Yes, on the, the one species model. Uh, yes, for the one species model, uh, two and uh, in already show that. And for the two species, the two species MYY model, it was shown by Yang. So they show that if the initial population is proposed suitable, then the, the free boundary move with a constant speed. Yeah. Okay. So the answer and is affirmative. So for suitable initial condition. I see. Okay. So another question was asked by Mr. Ariful Islam. How can you determine the traveling wave speed C? Is it by maximum principle or something like that? Uh, Actually, we just use the ODE method. So we consider the, the so-called PQ equation, that is standard method. And also we use the variation, variational method. So here we, oh, uh, we, yes, we use some maximum principle, but mainly not maximum principle. Yeah. I see, okay. And the last question is, this question is from my side. So for uh -huh. traveling, wave, when the traveling wave speed is zero, so what kind of spatial profile you can expect when the traveling I think uh, is zero? Is it a, like a kind of standing wave? Yeah, yeah. It's like a, a kind of standing wave. So the profile looks like here. I show you in the screen, but I with see, speed zero. Yeah. Yeah, like a standing wave, yeah. Standing wave, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Now I can receive just one or two quick questions from the audience, if you have any more questions. So please ask, the floor is now. We can receive one or two quick questions. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Humayun, I want to ask a question to Dr. Shen. Yes, can please, ask? please, please. Okay, so um, in the number one or number six, 
you just defined a computation model for the population densities P and Q, right, for invasive species. So according to this model, you can show either the number six, like you just consider your presentation in number one, number two, number three, like that. So on that system, for two species system, it shows that both P and Q, right, this one. Here in this equation, both P and Q are completely seems independent. So what is the interaction between P and Q? That's my question actually. Sorry, I'm not clear. So I think the uh, interaction between Q and, Q and the P and Q actually comes only from the free bound point. So away from the free bound point, actually there is, is no direct interaction. So the direct interaction only comes from the free bound point. So this is a very special case. Okay, and here both P and Q both are uh, invasive species or one species invasive? Uh, you mean uh, both uh, species uh, invade, invasive? Invas yeah, both species are invasive or the single one? Uh, depends. So, uh, depends on the depends on the coefficient alpha one and alpha two, and sometimes also depends on the initial condition. So, uh, a typical situation that given a initial data like this, then it will approach to a traveling wave. So, if wave to goes to the right then we can say uh, P wins. And if the wave go to the left, then we can say Q wins. Yeah. So in, in this sense, we, we check us which one is stronger, yeah. Okay, so it's fine, I'm fine. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank okay. you. Thank you for your good okay. questions. Okay. So thank you very much, Professor. Chuan Chen for your nice talk. This is very interesting problem to me because I have little experience work on pre-boundary problem when I was a PhD student. And let me let me convey the regards of Professor Mimura to you because Professor Mimura personally uh, wrote me to pass his regards to you uh, because okay. it is too late uh, late night in Japan. That's why he yeah. didn't join today. Probably tomorrow yeah. he will join with us. Okay, that's so great. Once again. So, Once again, I like to thank Professor Chin Chuan Chen and let me share an appreciation on behalf of the society. So, thank you, Professor Copper. Thank you, Professor Kani. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. you thank know, you very much. This is an appreciation on yeah. behalf of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology to Professor Chin Chuan. Of course, we will send it to Professor Chin Chen later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, so, uh, Dr. Peel. And uh, I think we are out of time, so we should stop this session here. And again, I would like to thank a lot to Professor Chen for his nice talk and hope to see you again in another international conference. Okay, so, see, you. see you. Thank see you very much. Our next thank session you. will start soon. So thank you very much. So thank, thank you very much. Kabir. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Osmanguni, to conduct this session. And I would like to thanks to Professor Chun Chian Chen for his nice, wonderful talk. And we want to move to our next session, I mean, session 1B. So, the speaker of that session is Professor Dr. Simon Levin. Professor Simon Levin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much. So, Professor Simon Levin is a distinguished professor of the Department of Biology in the Princeton University, United States of America. So, he has a remarkable contribution in mathematical biology in different parts of, in different level. And please welcome Professor Dr. Simon Levin.
to this conference. And this session is chaired by Professor Mohammad Shohidul Islam, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. So Dr. Mohammad Shohidul Islam is one of the presidents of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. So before starting the session, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, extend my sincere thanks to Professor Simon Levin for accepting our invitation within very short time. So on my personal behalf and on behalf of the Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks and gratitude to Professor Simon Levin. Now I'd like to request Professor Dr. Muhammad Shuhidul Islam to conduct this session. Thank you. Over to Professor Dr. Muhammad Shuhidul Islam. Thank you so much, Dr. Humayun Kobir. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is great honor for me to introduce Professor uh, Dr. Simon uh, Levin this virtual conference. Professor uh, Dr. Simon Levin is Professor of James S. McDonald Distinguished University, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Princeton University, USA, uh, the title of his talk is Mathematical Ecology, a Sensory of Progress and Silence for the Future. Mathematical Ecology is one of the oldest and most exciting in mathematical biology and it has helped in the management of natural system and infectious disease. So I would like to say a few words about uh, Professor Dr. Simon Levin. Professor Dr. Simon Levin is currently working as a professor, uh, James S. McDonald Distinguished University in the Department of Ecology and Environmental Biology. He is also associated faculty of Edlinga uh, Ed Center of Energy and Environment and Princeton University Center of Human uh, Values. He is visiting professor of Arizona State University. He is founding director of Princeton Environmental Institute. Professor uh, Levin is an ecologist noted especially for his contribution to the development of the foundation of special uh, ecology for his book of Fatan and Scale and more recently for his research at the interface between ecology and economics, especially problem of public goods common full resource and global uh, commons. His book, Fragile uh, Dominion, along with his subsequent research, OEFs these themes together in booking ecological and, and, by, uh, and uh, evolutionary theory of informed principle for management factors. He is combined mathematical modeling with empirical investigation to explore the dynamics of biodiversity and biocomplexity, including infectious disease and interaction between ecological system and socioeconomic systems. Professor Levin has been awarded numerous prestigious awards, including A. S. Heinken Prize for Environmental Science, Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science in 2004, Kyushu Prize for Basic Science, Imori Foundation, Zafan 2005, Raymond McGill Prize in Ecology and Environmental Science, Government of Catalonia in 2010, Taylor Prize for Environment Achievement in 2014, Luca uh, Facilo Fries, Capo City University in uh, Beans, Italy in 2014, National Medal of Science in 2014, etc. Professor Levin has been serving in numerous editorial boards, including Journal of Mathematical Biology, Bulletin for Mathematical Biology, Theoretical Ecology, Mathematical Biosciences. Applied Mathematics Letters, etc. Professor Levin has given many invited and keynote lectures all over the world. Professor Levin has outstanding contribution in mathematical biology, 
especially in theoretical ecology and evolutionary problems. The research and expository book of Professor Levin has influenced the research direction and activities of large number of mathematicians, many of whom are playing important roles in the field of mathematical ecology today. Hopefully, the talk will be interesting and very informative and enjoyable. So I'd like to welcome Professor Dr. Simon Levin to present the talk. So uh, I'd like to welcome Professor uh, Simon Levin. Thank you very much. Uh, for your kind invitation. Can you hear me and see my slides? Yes, yes, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Very good. So thank you for your uh, kind introduction and thanks Professor Chen for the lecture we j just heard. It was very good to hear about the work of my old friend and colleague, Mayan Minmora also. So this lecture will be a little less technical and more of an, uh, an overview. And first of all, I wanna thank the uh, the many uh, funding sources that have uh, supported my work over the years. So the cradle of ecology, the beginnings of ecology are in natural history, and that remains the foundation of the this, of this subject. Um, but understanding ecological patterns early on meant trying to understand dynamic patterns, like the interaction between hair and lynx. So ecology evolved, and it continues to do so, building bridges with mathematics, which is why we're all here today. Uh, with physics, with chemistry, with engineering, uh, more recently with genomics, and to a lesser extent with the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, but the argument I'm going to make today is that we're going to have to um, enlarge that interaction. I'll come back to this. The first part of my lecture will briefly touch on some of the classical advances, some of which you've just heard in Professor Chen's lecture, but based on the work of the great mathematician Vito Volterra and also of Alfred Lotka and others. I'll then move on to the computation revolution because after all, mathematics and computing are now speeding advances across biology, uh, of course in genomics and protein structure, but also in classical areas like evolution and epidemiology, especially in the face in the current pandemic and in immunology and ecology. And then I'm gonna close by talking about what I think are some challenges, some new directions what I call prospects for the future. So what I'm gonna argue is we need to enlarge that bubble on the lower right, where we interact, especially with the social sciences, but also with the humanities in dealing with issues of ethics. In ecology, mathematical approaches have a long history, going back to Volterra in demography, life history, theory, evolutionary biology, behavioral ecology, and the interactions of species and how they build up the communities. But also not just basic theory, but applications to things like infectious diseases, like the COVID um, virus that you see pictured there, but also fisheries harvesting theory, the, the subject of conservation and reserve design, bioeconomics and social systems, and more recently, climate change. The roots of it go back to the 17th century, at the very least, to the work of John Grout and others who were uh, dealing with the demography of the population of the big cities of the time. Um, but mathematical evolutionary theory is also an old subject, and uh, we just heard about basically Fisher-type equations, but Fisher, Haldane, and Wright were the great figures in mathematizing population genetics. And the dynamics of interacting species already mentioned the work of Volterra and Latka and all the work that's built on it that many of you, for sure, have worked on. And very more recently, we've all been reminded of the role of, of that mathematical models have played in understanding the dynamics of infectious diseases and uh, how we roll out vaccination strategies, herd immunity, and all of the other things we've heard about with COVID-19. In conservation biology, there have been big successes in reserve design and in the management of fisheries, which hinges on conservation biology, uh, on optimal strategies for uh, extraction from a limited resource, a topic to which I will return, but in a social science framework. And finally, more recently, climate change re research is relying mo much more heavily on modeling approaches, and I will talk a little bit about that. So problems of this sort highlight what I think are a number of grand challenges. Three I will um, 
I will highlight in environmental science. First of all, what is it that makes the systems that we care about robust and resilient to critical transitions? For example, is climate change destabilizing ecosystems? When I finish talking about robustness and resilience, I will then turn to understanding patterns, uh, understanding what makes the systems what we value, emergence and scaling from the microscopic to the macroscopic. For example, if we, under, if we know how individual fish are gonna respond to temperature, can we predict rain shifts and extinctions under climate change? And then in the last third, which will actually be more than a third of the lecture, uh, I will deal with what we call problems of the commons, how we share common resources, how we develop insurance arrangements and more generally international agreements. Well, let's go back to the roots to physics from physical systems to biological systems. We know that there are macroscopic features that emerge from microscopic details, whether we are um, heating a fluid or, uh, or, or putting it under pressure, the likelihood of a, of, of a transition uh, is something we want to predict and statistical mechanics has developed to do that. It depends obviously on all the molecules, but we don't have to account for what every molecule is doing. We deal with the statistical problems. Well, can we apply that to ecological systems and to social systems? Ecosystems and the biosphere are what we call complex adaptive system. Like this bird flock, these are all starlings creating these fantastic patterns, individual, and all starlings except for one hawk that you might see that's driving some of this behavior. So can we understand the behavior of these systems by understanding the statistical mechanics of all of those uh, individual birds and how they, um, how they change? It, complex adaptive systems are, like this system, heterogeneous collections of individual units that interact locally and evolve based on the outcomes of those interactions. But not just the ecological systems, but the socioeconomic systems that they're interlinked with are also complex adaptive systems made up of individual agents who are pursuing their own selfish agendas. For example, banking systems. In 2008, the late ecologist Robert May, together with George Sugihara and me, wrote a paper in the journal Nature uh, worrying about banking systems, saying they were much like uh, ecological systems, but they were becoming increasingly interconnected and, uh, um, and therefore we argued more fragile because when ecological systems get too interconnected, too, the, the, they, the, they run the risk of what we call systemic risk, uh, a contagious spread. We said, who knows, for example, how the present concern over subprime loans will pan out which was a major driver in the collapse of the banking markets. And six months later, we saw this prediction realized, unfortunately, as world banking systems collapsed. But transitions of this sort are not confined to banking systems. They also extend to ecological systems like shallow lakes, as laid out in Martin Schaeffer's wonderful book, uh, Critical Transitions in Nature and Society and also to our own hearts and brains. And that's why we look for early warning systems. That's why when someone my age goes to the doctor every year, the doctor does an electrocardiogram looking at my heart to try to see if there are early warning indicators that problems are arising. So I will return to this, but let me say that these sorts of, this potential for system flips for alternative communities exist in all kinds of ecological communities, in microbial communities, for example, but also the potential uh, for great shifts in our climate system, in, in, the, um, in the flow diagrams in the oceans, in which a major change could have dramatic consequences for all of our societies. And we see these collapses and potential for collapses in fisheries as well as in many other species. So what can we say about this? What can we predict about this? And are our own societies at threat of collapse? Well, let's go back to the basic of how an ecologist would model the dynamics of interactions. This is my late colleague, and now it's 40 years since he died, Robert Whitaker, but we published many things together. Um, and this is his diagram, which is a classical diagram 
uh, in ecology in which if one knows the average temperature and the average pre precipitation, one can predict what the species assemblages will look like, where you'll have tropical rainforest, where you'll have a desert, or where you'll have grassland, et cetera. You, don't, you can't predict exactly which species will be there, but you can predict the type of species. So um, I, I will talk a bit more about this, but um, even within some of these boundaries, especially at the edge between say grassland and forest, between savanna and forest, there is some uncertainty. And some of that uncertainty is what we've explored. That is my student, Carla Staver, now a professor at Yale University and Sally Archibald, uh, a, a South African ecologist, trying to understand why we get patterns of this sort. So these are the sorts of areas that Whitaker would predict should be savanna, and they are. And here is an area that is predicted should be forest, and it is. But then there are these areas in between on the edges, which might be savanna and might be forest, and indeed where there's some bi-stability. So we're interested in understanding that bi-stability and in also understanding the spatial dimensions of what determines um, what is going to occur where. Now, what accounts for this bi-stability? Well, to a large extent, it's fire. Grass burns, but that doesn't hurt the grass. It regrows, but it prevents the, the trees that would come in otherwise from advancing to become mature trees. So for example, if you look uh, at um, global patterns, uh, uh, for, for example, in Africa, as the areas where fire is present, uh, and areas where fire is absent, you'll see that if the tree cover is high, we don't get very many fires. If tree cover is low, we get fires because those are grass dominated systems and it's the grass that burns. So we set out to model the rate of spread of fire. This is especially work uh, with Emanuel Scherzer, a former postdoc of mine, in we which we built a percolation model uh, you know, an interacting particle model in which every site is either uh, grass or not, and and where we we measure the potential for fire to spread. Uh, and what we see that is, uh, at low levels of grass, we don't get fires. There's very little burnt area, but as grass increases, fire increases, and it does so dramatically, as you would expect in a percolation model. So remember this figure here burnt area, which is the probability of fire basically as a function of grass coverage, turn it upside down and you will, you will see the, the rate at which um, saplings will advance to become mature trees. Because if fire is rare, saplings grow into trees. And that's what we see at the top here. This is the probability that saplings will advance. We call it omega of G. And as the grass level increases, fire increases, and the likelihood that saplings will advance to become uh, adult trees goes down. So we model this system by breaking up all of the space into grass, saplings, and trees. This is the same species, but these are young of these individuals. And we simply write down the transitions. For example, um, the rate at which grass gets converted into saplings, here's the minus beta GT, here's the plus beta GT, is proportional to the amount of grass that's there, but it's not proportional to the number of saplings, it's proportional to the number of trees because they produce the propagules, the seeds that eventually grow into saplings. So there's this convergence term, and then there's this convergence term that I already talked about, This uh, at the rate at which saplings get converted to become uh, adult trees. The other terms are just natural death terms that immediately get converted into grass. Since this, if you add up these equations, you get zero, which means G plus S plus T equals one. Um, so it looks like a three dimensional system, but it's really only a two dimensional system. I'm not gonna take you through the analysis. It's not very difficult analysis, but what we find is that depending on the parameters, we may end up with one stable state, which is dominated by grass, or one in which grass is rare and it's dominated by saplings and trees. But in the intermediate region here, depending on the parameters, and those parameters depend upon precipitation, we get bi-stability. We get two stable states separated by 
an, an unstable state. And so if, um, as I'll show you in the next slide, precipitation levels change due to climate change, we might expect the system to um, eventually flip from one equilibrium to another, depending on which way it goes. So you're all familiar with these sorts of diagrams. Let's focus on the one at the top here. Uh, if precipitation levels are high, the system is tree dominated. If precipitation levels are low, it's grass dominated. So you can imagine, for example, if precipitation levels were gonna get smaller and smaller, um, not eventually you'd reach a point where the forests disappear and grass would dominate. And in fact, what's going to happen as you get close to it is the rate at which the system recovers the equilibrium goes down, the stability characteristics get less and the potential for, in this case, we're showing it in the other direction for um, a small perturbation to knock the system to the other equilibrium uh, increases. So the fact that the rate of slowing of, of return to equilibrium slows down is what's called critical slowing down. Uh, and we see this not only in these um, savanna forest systems um, in which it, once a change occurs, of course, because of hysteresis, it's going to be difficult to reverse, but we see it in shallow lakes. We see it with pest populations, and we're worried that we might see it with the circulation patterns in the ocean. But the question of early warning indicators asks, can we anticipate critical transitions? Uh, and um, this is a paper in which I happen to be part, but it's led by Martin Schaeffer. Uh, and a, a lot of work that he's been leading on early warning indicators. Um, you saw the system returning to equilibrium and that the rate at which it returns to equilibrium was slowing and that eventually we may lose that basin of attraction altogether. So the signals that we see here are critical slowing down. That is the rate of return going down. Uh, increasing variance, increasing autocorrelation uh, as the system stays away from equilibrium longer and maybe starting to flicker between states. So this is a very promising area. We can look at it from banking systems to ecological systems to heart rates, et cetera, to microbial systems. Are they these early warning signals? I think it's a very exciting area, but we have to be um, uh, careful because not all signals, not, not all systems undergoing transitions show these early warning signals. Uh, for example, if this ball were rolling along the table, getting closer to the end, you would have no indicator uh, that you were losing stability, at, at least not from short range sorts of information. And this has been elucidated terrifically by the next speaker, my collaborator and former student, Alan Hastings, together with Carl Bodiger and Noam Ross, as they've laid out some of the concerns in over-interpreting these early warning indicators. It reminded me a lot of the excitement 50 years ago that very few of you, maybe none of you will remember uh, when Rene Tom started talking about catastrophe theory um, and uh, what he called structural stability by writing a system of dynamical equations in which the derivatives were the gradients of a potential function a potential function of low, um, a, a polynomial of low degree and showing how one could characterize the sorts of elementary transitions, bifurcations that he called catastrophes that could occur. Well, people started seeing those sorts of cusp diagrams that I just showed you and said, well, it must be due to this simple model of, um, of René Toms. So the subject got oversold just because A implies B doesn't mean when you see B, it was A that caused it. And this caused the collapse of interest to a large extent uh, in, in catastrophe theory. To a large extent because bifurcation theory starts from mechanisms, catastrophe theory works the other direction. We need to emphasize mechanisms. Uh, and so that, be, that moves me to the second part of the lecture. Um, the second challenge of systems theory, getting the mechanisms right. How do we scale from the microscopic to the microscopic? How the patterns emerge? Mayan Memora's postdoctoral advisor, Jim Murray has written a wonderful book, which if you haven't seen, I recommend to you all. It's actually out as two volumes now, 
um, in which he studies things like the coat patterns of zebras and giraffes uh, and trying to understand how they emerge from local rules. Um, if we could understand that, we could understand maybe how we could move from individual interactions to, to range shifts in fisheries um, and to the loss of biodiversity. So returning to the cartoon I showed you before, if we're interested in sustainability, whoever's got their microphone on can you mute it because it's background noise there. Sustainability has to focus on the macroscopic features of systems while we recognize that control of those is resting at lower levels of organization. Whether we're heating water to make tea or putting things under pressure. Again, I wonder if whoever is has their microphone open creating a lot of noise we could, can we silence? Professor Simon Levin, I would like to request to unmute yourself. Professor Simon Levin, please unmute your audio. Professor, Professor Simon Levin, please unmute your audio. We cannot hear you. Is that better? Yes, yes, yes. Now it is okay. Yes, please. I, I don't know. Somebody, I didn't mute myself. Somebody muted me. Okay. Uh, did, did you get the, did it just become muted now? Uh, I can continue from this slide? Yes, yes, yes. Please continue. Yeah. So um, if we're interested in sustainability, we have to focus on the macroscopic features while recognizing that control of those rests at lower levels of organization. We have to develop a statistical mechanics, uh, a, a thermodynamics of the system. So for example, forest growth models as developed by Dan Botkin, Hank Schugert, and my colleague, Steve Pakala, uh, begin by growing individual trees, letting them shade each other, send out propagules, uh, and they give rise to these sorts of diagrams on the right where each color represents a different tree species. We don't predict where every tree is going to be uh, reliably, but we do predict what the statistical distribution of, um, of, of trees will be. If we move to broader scales, um, sorry, if we move to broader scales, these sorts of models can be integrated with the global climate models to make predictions globally about, not about what species will be where, but similar to the Whitaker diagram. That I, uh, again, uh, someone needs to mute themselves and not me. Um, yes. We can see what sorts of ecotypes can be found in different regions in relation to temperature uh, and um, precipitation. Um, the same sorts of approaches have been taken for oceanic systems. These are nutrients, these are phytoplankton, these are zooplankton. Uh, these are different types of nutrients, different types of phytoplankton, different types of zooplankton. Um, and first of all, these are the redistribution terms. And then there, these are the interaction terms that deals with the rates that different phytoplankton take up different kinds of resources, uh, et cetera. Um, this is the work of Mick Follows, something called the Darwin model. Um, it's a large scale model, hundreds of species put into competition and then allowed to develop the patterns of distribution on the globe. Just as with the vegetation models, one sees not where individual species will be globally, but what sorts of ecotypes will be found, where one finds diatoms and the large eukaryotes, where different species of Prochlorococcus and Sinecococcus will be found. <laughs> so these are extremely reliable uh, models uh, predicting patterns of distribution on the globe. We can do the same thing for uh, fish schools, as you see on the left here, for the bird flocks I showed you before, uh, as well as for these reindeer uh, herds that you see at the bottom. And more recently, efforts to extend this to examining collective decision-making in human societies. 
which is what I'll talk a lot about in the last part of the lecture. So that's what brings me to the last part of the lecture, prospects for the future, the interface with the social sciences and the humanities. How do we manage the local commons? How do we develop international agreements? On issues like climate change, there are strong scientific con consensus, as well as on many other issues like um, biodiversity loss. We know that um, temperatures are increasing. We know that that's actually might benefit some regions, uh, for example, in, in Russia, but it's not going to be good for Bangladesh, for sure. Uh, it's going to lead to increased flooding and uh, submergence of, um, of coastal communities. Despite that, adequate action to address them has been lacking. The primary limitations to solutions aren't that we don't know the biology and the physics and the chemistry, uh, but we don't know the social science. We don't know how to get people to and governments to commit to the common good and to cooperate in finding solutions that benefit everybody. So I think that's really the exciting new area where we mathematical ecologists have to work. Um, take, for example, some of these studies on different attitudes towards climate change. Uh, this was a study done by an organization called Resources for the Future many years ago, uh, 20 years ago, comparing the US, China, and Sweden. And as you see, if you look at any of these questions, whether there's an increase in temperature, whether it's our fault, and what we can do about it, in China and Sweden, there's overwhelming consensus that climate change is a problem. Very different governments, very different political structures. In the US, it was much lower, 73%. Uh, 73% is, of course, a substantial majority, but it's much less than the 95% plus or minus one that we saw in the other countries. Um, take it from another direction. If you look still in the US at attitudes towards climate change and global warming, in 2008, 70% of the people were either alarmed, concerned, or cautious. Um, in 2010, that had dropped substantially. In fact, the percent that had dropped from alarm and concern went from 51% to 39%. By 2016, it was back up to 45%. And today it's back up about to where it was in 2008. What happened in between? Well, what happened was that we had a financial crisis and people said, let's deal with that first and not take the steps to deal uh, with climate change. Uh, look at it in a more recent study. Uh, this is still, and most of the data I have now are for uh, the United States. Uh, you see again that in 2008, 51% uh, were very sure global warming was happening. That dropped dramatically in 2010, but now it's back up to 49%. Um, and so we see two things. We see, first of all, great cost cultural differences uh, or great, maybe it's across political system differences. And we also see the degree to which external events can cause sudden shifts. And finally, we see how rapidly uh, attitudes and social norms can switch. Here's another example, mask wearing. Again, someone has unmuted themselves there. Um, if, if you look at countries like, um, like China or Taiwan, mask wearing has been, in, during any sorts of epidemic, uh, something which has always uh, been prevalent. Um, and it continues to be in the face of COVID-19. If you look at the Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway, and Finland, uh, you'll see exactly the opposite pattern, that mask wearing has never been uh, prominent and it continues not to be a factor. And then there's a third set of countries, including uh, the Western European countries and the United States, in which mask wearing was not prevalent. But then as they, during the pandemic um, and emphasis on the benefits of mask wearing, there's been a transition. So we've been modeling this, my group, uh, and together with a Swedish group, um, and uh, trying to understand, again, the multiple stable states and how the norms can switch. Social norms can change rapidly. My uh, paper with um, 
Paul Ehrlich 15 years ago uh, laid this out, things like foot binding, which was prevalent in China for centuries and then suddenly disappeared. I don't know what the situation is in, um, in Bangladesh, but in the United States and now more and more in Western Europe, smoking in public places uh, is becoming something which one doesn't do. Attitudes towards racial equality, gender equality, climate change, as I've already shown you, and the pandemic. Attitudes can change rapidly. Uh, so we want to understand why and how we can take advantage of that. The central issues are issues of behavior and culture. Um, issues of equity, intergenerational and intragenerational. Public goods and common pool resources, about which I'll tell you more. How do we get cooperation in the commons? What's the role of social norms and institutions like foot binding? How do we, how do we develop leadership and consensus in addressing the problems that we need to address? So what do I mean by equity? Well, we discount. We discount the future, not only our own futures, but the future of um, our children and our grandchildren. We dis and, and by the way, that the way we discount the future was crucial to the conclusions in studies like the Stern Review um, for the British government on what we ought to do about climate change. We also discount the interests of others. Um, if one, if I were have flown to, if I were to have flown to Bangladesh, uh, I would not yet have to worry about the person next to me talking on the telephone the whole way. But you can imagine if we ever allow telephones on airplanes, how awful that will be. Uh, how do we protect ourselves, others, and future generations against the consequences of our overuse of resources? First of all, we can buy insurance. That's the first step towards cooperative solutions. We all get together, and I'll talk about one sort of insurance arrangement, but there are a variety of different kinds that I don't have time to talk about today. We have to develop cooperation with each other and caring for each other, pro-sociality. Uh, a lot of that will depend on the development of social norms and changes in public attitudes, um, which eventually morph into laws and religions. Now, these are words, they may not look like mathematics to you, but I'm gonna to try to convince you that there is a mathematical basis for dealing with these things uh, and we can have an impact on it and it's worthwhile to do so. Um, how do we develop international agreements? Let me give you one example. Work with Avinash Dixit and Dan Rubenstein. Various farmers with ranches close to each other, herdsmen in East Africa, share grazing grounds. Uh, if one of them has, uh, is having a bad year in terms of climate, uh, he goes to his neighbor and says, can I send my cattle over to graze on your land? Well, his neighbor has to decide whether there's reason to do that. Before I get into that, uh, let me first ask, what would be best for society as a whole? What would be best, let's say, for the two to the two farmers, suppose someone's in charge. Um, so we write down an equation uh, of this sort. X is the amount that I invest in my cattle, which is my own property. Uh, and um, Z, which you see down here, is the amount I invest in my land. Now, if I were to, and uh, this is what's called a Cobb-Douglas function, much used by uh, economists uh, as the payoff function. Um, and so it's really X to the alpha, Z to the beta, uh, but it's modified by, um, by how good a year it is. So A1 is the good year, A2 is the bad year. Um, and why do I have an M in here? Well, I've transferred M cattle from my property over to my neighbors. And so this is what the payoff would be. Why do I need this? Well, I'm making an investment in things. So there's a cost function, which here we represent as a quadratic. So the social optimum would come by maximizing this subject to M. M is the variable we, um, um, that's a control variable, and we just maximize this. But now my neighbor says, well, I don't care about the social optimum. What's in it for me? And I say, well, maybe next year the situation will be reversed and you can send your cattle to me. So my neighbor has to make a calculation uh, based on his so-called discount function, how much he cares about next year relative to this year. And this is how we solve all um, public goods, uh, commons problems. Uh, we first figure out what's the social optimum. And then we say, is this a game theoretic equilibrium? Is it a Nash equilibrium? Is it self-enforcing? 
Well, that will depend on the discount rate. But even if it's not, there may be the potential for what are called second best solutions. Uh, a second best solution says my neighbor says, well, I don't want all of your cattle, but you can send me 10. And I know that that means I can only send you 10 next year if I need to. So that's what's called a second best solution, optimizing over that number. But even then there's still a potential because the challenge is to maintain public goods. He may say, well, I wouldn't do this for myself, but my daughter married your son. And so I care about you. That's called prosociality. All of that comes into these calculations. I'll take, and, and prosociality obviously is good for cooperation, good for society. Uh, and with Avinash Dixit, um, um, I've shown that prosociality can actually be selected for because I and others think I want my children to be in a better world. Therefore, I will commit funding now in order to educate society that they ought to be more pro-social. And obviously, this is something that we need to be thinking about if we want to create a sustainable future. Public goods problems are widespread, not just in the sorts of socioeconomic settings like fishermen uh, competing with oil rigs, but also in our bodies, a tumor cell growth Tumor cell growth um, is the breakdown of the commons. Tumor cells grow at a rate too, too rapid uh, to sustain the organism, but they gain short-term benefit. Well, that's the problem we see in dealing with the commons, something that William Forster Lloyd talked about. We all discount the future at too high a rate and only care about our own selfish interest. So Garrett Hardin talked about the tragedy of the commons um, and for him, the solution was mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon, which meant he felt that we needed governments and agreements to step in and enforce things from the top down. But my late colleague, Lynn Ostrom, Nobel laureate, pointed out and showed in her work how cooperation and these mutually agreed upon norms could be developed from the bottom up um, as individuals develop social norms and agreements because they had this prosociality. So with Alessandro Tavoni and Maya Schluter, um, I've looked at problems of this sort, building on um, Lynn Ostrom's work, withdrawing from fisheries, one can withdraw either at low rates, those what we call cooperators, or at high rates, those are the selfish individuals. Uh, and I won't take you through all of the mathematics, but we write a system of equations. This is the frequency of cooperators. Uh, this is the payoff to cooperators. This is the payoff to defectors, those who withdraw at a high rate. And what is this term F sub C that it depends upon? It's the frequency of cooperators who band together to punish the defectors. And so the idea of this model, and I'll be happy to send anybody the reprint, print, uh, is to enforce cooperation by punishing those who withdraw at non-socially sustainable rates. And this is the resource that has to be coupled with us. When we look at the dynamics of these systems, what we find out is this is F sub C on the bottom, the frequency of cooperators. We generally have two equilibria, one a non-cooperative equilibrium down here somewhere uh, and the other cooperative equilibrium. You have to get the number of cooperators above a threshold amount in order to um, sustain cooperation and be better for society. And that's how international agreements are written as well. You have to get the number of signatory countries above a certain amount. Well, how do we extend this to climate change agreements? Lynn Ostrom talked about what she called a polycentric approach, which meant breaking the population up, in her case, into interacting countries in which one got small agreements and then build, making them be building blocks uh, towards global agreements. And Avinash Dixit and Andrew Tillman and I have been looking at models of that sort, very similar to the models I already told you about in which individuals either invest in themselves or in the collective good, or maybe in punishment. That creates some benefits locally, uh, which may trigger benefits globally. Um, I, I think given the interest of time, uh, I won't take you through this in detail, except to say one writes uh, an equation for the utility of individual I in group G, there's a payoff function similar to what I showed you. There's a cost function similar to what I showed you. Little z is my investment in the public good. Capital Z is the public good, which might be the, the aggregate or, or the uh, 
um, or the average of the contributions of individuals. And then there's this pro-sociality term, which means I care about the other individuals in my group. Um, and um, gamma of G is the amount I care about them. Anyway, we, we solve this as a, uh, for a large system as a Nash equilibrium problem to try to find uh, under what conditions cooperation uh, can evolve and we can get to these global solutions. Um, so finally, um, I mentioned some work being done with uh, Vitor Vasconcelos, Elke Weber, and Sarah Constantino on the changing of social norms. Uh, in, in our case, we're dealing with decarbonization in China, in India, in the United States, and elsewhere. Are people going to be willing to accept uh, less carbon intensive fuels? Uh, and these models, and we're looking at them for masks as well and other situations, we have a number of individuals. Each one of them has attitudes and actions, uh, take actions they take on a variety of issues as represented by this bit stream. They belong to groups and they belong to the interacting groups. And those groups have their own positions and attitudes. Uh, and individuals change their positions and attitudes based on whom they come into contact with, whether the individuals they come into contact with are part of the same group as them. And even on longer time scales, the group norms may change and individuals may decide to change groups. Um, we've applied this to global agreements on climate change in which nations belong to various international agreements and this affects the actions that they take on climate change. So let me summarize. In summary, the modeling of collective decision-making, which was what we need to deal with problems of the commons and our global environmental problems represents, I think, a new frontier for mathematical ecology. How do ideas get propagated? How do social norms arise and how do they spread? How do we achieve collective action in dealing with the global commons? Attitudinal shifts I've tried to show you uh, on things like mask wearing and climate change are important and we need to take them into account. Generally, they're driven by really only a few leaders and a many followers. That's a whole other lecture, uh, which I can't develop today, unfortunately. But we, we see in our models of, of animal groups that just a few leaders can drive the behavior. Well, we know that's true in our societies as well as a few leaders stake out positions and others follow along. Because these sudden shifts in attitudes um, are important, they're also given a lot of momentum by these large numbers of followers. That's why you can see these dramatic shifts taking place. And environmental action has to take this volatility into account. So to conclude, ecological systems and socio-system economic systems alike are what we call climate complex adaptive systems made up of individual agents who interact with their neighbors locally, change their behaviors, and this results in emergent patterns which feed back to influence the behaviors in other ways. We have to understand how to build the bridges between what individuals are doing, what collectives are doing, what the selfish inter interest of individuals are, what the se selfish interest of societies are, and including as individuals Countries, rich countries like the United States and poorer countries, uh, which need some degree of pro sociality and, and enlightened self interest by the richer countries if we're going to save the world that we live in. So, what are the challenges um, mathematically? Well, first of all, we need to continue steps towards developing a statistical mechanics of ecological systems, of bird flocks, fish schools, but also the socioeconomic systems of which we're embedded, the biosphere and the coupling with human systems. We need to continue working on modeling the emergence of pattern on multiple scales um, from the coke patterns of the giraffes up to the patterns of, of, um, of, of polarization in our societies. We certainly have to improve our ability to develop indicators of impending critical transitions between steps so we can, between different states, so we can take the proper steps before it's too late. But most challenging and most novel, I think, is the social science and humanities 
uh, dimension. We need to find pathways to governance in a multi-scale commons and mathematical modeling can play a fundamental role. It's done that in the past in other areas. For example, uh, in nuclear non-proliferation treaties, the late uh, Nobel laureate um, in economics, Thomas Schelling um, did a lot of work on this and regarded this as one of the great triumphs of game theory. Uh, theoretical ecology is a rich history. We've heard about it in this meeting, demography, behavior, ecosystems, infectious diseases, where with COVID-19, it's playing a major role, resource management, coupling with general circulation models and collective behavior. But going forward, I think we need to expand this repertoire. We need to uh, address new challenges. This is a special issue of the uh, Proceedings International Academy that I edited uh, a few years ago that attempted to bring together um, environment, ecology, and economics and other social sciences in order to achieve sustainable development. We need to address issues of eth ethics and equity, of societies and the attitudinal shifts within them, of pro-sociality and problems of the commons. Um, and with that uh, challenge, I, I hope I've motivated some of you and I thank you all for your attention. I'm done. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simon uh, Levin, for your nice uh, talk. So now I would like to request Dr. Humayun Kabir to contact the uh, question session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Shoydul Islam. So first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Dr. Simon Levin for his nice and wonderful talk today. So I have received a couple of questions from the audience. Yes. So the first question was by Mr. Jai, who is the uh, rainfall prediction? I, I'm sorry, you, you Which broke model up. is better for the rainfall prediction? Uh, I, 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 Which I'm, model is better for the rainfall prediction? Oh, well, I didn't talk about models for rainfall prediction. Rainfall prediction. Yeah, I understand. The, um, the yes. best models for rainfall prediction are models developed by... Um, um, by individuals like um, Ignacio Rodriguez uh, Iturbe. These models, of course, are, are highly stochastic um, models because there may be great variation um, in, um, uh, spatially in, in, in rainfall patterns. Um, this, is, this is not an area of my expertise, but, um, but I direct you to the work of uh, Rodriguez Iturbe, um, who's um, one of the leading high, high, and, and other hydrologists like Andrea Ronaldo. Um, but it, of course, it, 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 it interfaces with, with ecophysiology as well. Um, so those are the best models uh, that I know. Okay, thank you. The next question is, uh, do the results computed from mathematical models of biological phenomena actually correspond to the real world? Well, of course, that's an interesting question. And uh, uh, the, um, um, there are a variety of reasons why we develop models. Um, I mean, the short answer is yes, they certainly um, um, map onto the real world. But the, but the question is, for what purpose have the models been developed? Now, we develop models for a, a lot of different purposes. We, we develop them for prediction. We develop them for understanding. We, we develop them for management. And we develop them just as um, um, systems that people can use to become familiar with possible outcomes. Um, we expect different things out of validation on those models. Um, and I think for the most part, and, and case in point would be evolutionary theory and population genetics, the models are much more successful in helping understanding than they are uh, in, um, um, in terms of prediction. They can often be good, however, in terms of, of, of management. Now, the reason they're better at understanding than prediction has been pointed out by Francois Jacob because these models are um, uh, have multi 
uh, have, have multiple um, possible basins of attraction uh, and um, and um, history, uh, path dependence, hysteresis, um, and, and therefore prediction of the future, uh, as um, some uh, sage once said, is, can be extremely difficult. Nonetheless, I think the one of the places these sorts of models have been extremely effective is in the prediction of um, of the what's going to happen during a pandemic. There's a big range, no question, and um, and what management strategies like mask wearing um, and um, um, quarantining, self isolation, and the use of vaccines to do. Vaccine therapy theory: the percentage of individuals one has to vaccinate has been one of the great successes of mathematical biology. In general, when you get into these areas, I th and, and this includes climate change, I think it's extremely important to pay attention to sensitivity analysis and to develop multiple models that weaken the assumptions uh, and say, how dependent uh, is the outcome uh, upon uh, uh, what, we, uh, we, what we put into the model? Um, and um, it's another reason why I think we have to emphasize moving from the microscopic to the macroscopic coarse graining models um, in order to, to, to reduce the number of parameters that have to be modeled. The, 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 the great physicist Albert Einstein uh, warned us to make the models as simple as we can, but not simpler. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, next question is how the catastrophic change can be studied in reference to evolutionary dynamics of ecological species? Well, in general, um, catastrophic changes are, are, are modeled by, um, um, I mean, I gave you an example from the forest savanna system um, by uh, trying to understand the degree to which the outcomes might be dependent, say, on initial conditions, whether there are multiple stable states and the like. Um, secondly, um, by the development of early warning indicators. And third, that I didn't talk about, trying to understand what are the factors in system um, that make systems um, robust so that you, you don't have critical transitions, assuming you're in a state um, that you want to be in and want to maintain. Um, and, and I, I, I hinted uh, at that a little bit in talking about the banking system, because the three main structural properties of systems can, that can reduce the potential for critical transition are higher diversity, a good degree of redundancy, and especially a compartmentalization or modularity to prevent systemic spread. Now, in terms of um, uh, applying this to evolutionary models, uh, I, I um, I don't know any models um, that have successfully attempted to predict critical transitions, except to the extent that you might argue that the outbreak of a new pandemic or even um, a more modest, which is the evolution of um, seasonal flu strains, uh, reflect new outbreaks, therefore new critical transitions. And one can study those um, mechanistically, but more generally, what you um, what you're generally able to say is that there are going to be critical transitions. Uh, we just can't predict what exactly they're going to be or where they're going to be. We don't know which new virus. We, nobody knew COVID nineteen was coming. Um, uh, we just have to develop systems to be prepared for this. Evolution has done this by developing ways to deal with it, something called our immune systems, which um, have our hierarchical system going from generalized responses at the beginning to um, antibodies that are specific to particular antigens, but it's the generalized responses that buy time. I think we have to, uh, instead of trying to predict um, critical transitions, which I think is gonna be very difficult to do, we simply have to predict that they're going to happen and develop response systems that allow us to respond uh, once they do. And we can also develop approaches like uh, compartmentalization that limit the potential for those systems to take place. Thank you. The uh, next question is, 
Dr. Gautam Shah asked a question: Why most researchers say most accurate and unrealistic? Uh, I'm sorry, because you you uh, disappeared uh, for. Many researchers claim that most of the mathematical models are unrealistic. Why? You'll have to ask them. <laughs> I don't know which researchers uh, <laughs> one's talking about. Um, I, I've been working in mathematical ecology for uh, for 50 years, and in fact, I've been working in mathematical biology for longer since um, I began by working on. Um, active transport of sodium across red blood cell membranes. My PhD is in mathematics. I'm trained in mathematics. Whatever field I've gone to, there are always um, the people who say mathematical models are unrealistic. Um, they have their own reasons. Uh, and of course, many mathematical models are, are unrealistic. Uh, so I think it's our job to, to make the models as realistic as possible. It's an interesting discussion what realism means. Realism does not mean um, incorporating every detail. If so, you wouldn't need the model. It means finding the, the essence of what's going on. The, um, um, the, as Einstein said, the simplest model that captures uh, these features. So I've seen this resistance in many fields. I think often because people in those fields feel threatened uh, by someone coming in with techniques that they don't know. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, we have lots of examples of unrealistic mathematical models. If you even, I, I don't know whether you even want to call these mathematical models, but if you look at the, the, at the debate that's been going on about how we deal with COVID-19 in various countries in Sweden, originally in the United Kingdom, and some forces in the United States have been arguing that we ought to, that the best way to deal with that is herd immunity, letting lots of people get sick Professor Simon, please, please unmute. I, uh, oh, yes, now it is okay. Yeah, I, I unmuted my, you muted me, so I unmuted yeah. myself. Um, so th that's a model. I think it's a very poor model. Um, and um, so there will always be those, first of all, there are bad models and there are people who will be threatened. However, um, when I first started working in ecology, no ecology department had a mathematician in it. Now, no first-rate ec uh, ecology department is without uh, at least one uh, person who's doing um, deep mathematical ecology. Immunology, infectious diseases, all subject, and certainly neurobiology uh, and, um, um, and genomics are all areas that historically um, had very little um, mathematical input initially had resistance from people who said mathematical models are unrealistic and now no department would be without them. Uh, so I think um, we, it, it behooves us to do good mathematical modeling. And part of that means working closely with experimentalists and empiricists to make sure they understand the assumptions and work with us. Um, and that's the way we, we achieve that. I'm not a psychologist. I can't tell you all the reasons why people say mathematical models are unrealistic, except to admit that many of them are. Um, but there will always be those who, who um, don't um, believe in them. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one or two questions from the audience. I would like to open the floor. Please uh, raise your questions. One or two quick questions I can. There is one question, Dr. Kobe. There is one question. Yes, yes. Professor Levin, seen. there is one question. Uh, actually, a real data collection to simulate the model is a little bit challenging. So how can we collect the real and re reliable data to simulate the model? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. How can we what? How, how, to, how to collect the real data to simulate the model? I think it's increasingly important to interface our, our models with, um, with real data. Um, 
Uh, I think we shouldn't take the, the real data too literally because of the high degrees of uncertainty about most data sources. I think generally speaking, um, all we can expect from the data is to give us a range of possible outcomes, uh, which emphasizes the importance of testing the sensitivity of our models to, um, to errors uh, uh, in, in the data. And, and when I say errors, I don't necessarily mean the data are wrong, but they may not be representative uh, of a broader uh, swath of, um, of individuals. Um, but yes, it, it, it's increased. I, I think um, we can't be satisfied. It's a lot of fun to work on mathematical equations. I've done a lot of that myself. Uh, in some cases, all of those, those models can do is suggest what sorts of data people can collect. But, um, but we have to find ways to test the models uh, and to understand the range of possibilities. By the way, there's, there, there's another interesting aspect of, 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 of how models can be used. In, early in my career, I developed a model which, can, which looked at a range of possible outcomes for um, evolutionarily. That's what we do in looking at evolutionary models. Uh, <clears throat> one of my empirical colleagues said to me, why do you make those assumptions and allow for the possibilities of species that we've never observed or characteristics we've never observed? And my answer was, be, was really the, the, the answer that Francois Jacob in his book, The Possible and the Actual, gave more impressively, which is to understand why we see what we see, we have to embed it within a framework of other things we might have seen and ask, why, what, why don't we see those? Uh, we, we, so there are no data for those. We have to ask, why do we only see these particular strains of influenza that we see? Is it because of historical pattern or is it because of biophysical limits that prohibit these things? How do we find out what are the optimal solutions from the set of possible outcomes, which from an evolutionary point of view explains why we think why we see the things we see. So, um, so sometimes um, we have to be looking at models for which there are no data, but in, in general, I think the the, the um, assumption behind this point is an excellent one. We have to be working more closely with um, empiricists and statisticians to um, um, to fit our model with data. I, uh, I I showed you how we did that for the forest savanna models, and certainly we're doing that a lot for the uh, for the pandemic models. Okay, thank you. The last question is. Uh, do you think any ethical shift in human being to control this uh, current pandemic? Ethical uh, shift in human behavior to control the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, well, was the question, um, will a shift? E ethic or, e or ethical shift, ethical shift in human behavior. Well, do you uh, think any ethical shift in human yeah. The, the, um, so I, I, let, let me answer two questions. I'm not sure which question was being asked, but I'll answer the one that was being asked and another one, and I don't know which one's which. Um, obviously, we need an ethical shift in human behavior. There is an assumption, for example, that by many, um, that mask wearing is entirely to protect me if I wear a mask. Uh, and therefore, it's my decision, uh, and nobody else has any business telling me what to do. But we know that that's not true. We know that one of the benefits of mask wearing, and perhaps probably the greatest benefit of mask wearing, is so that I don't affect other individuals, infect other individuals. Similarly with quarantining, and it's to some extent true with regard to vaccines. These are commons problems. These are public goods problems. Much of my behavior um, I, is not just for my, myself, and that's why it's not just my decision. It's a societal decision. Now, society, as Garrett Hardin said, we can impose that from the top down, and we may have to, but it would be much better if um, people took their actions um, 
in order to um, to benefit not only themselves themselves but others in their society, recognizing that their behaviors protects others. Um, you don't go visit your 90 year old grandmother without taking precautions because 90 year olds are very much at risk. That's an ethical consideration. So we certainly need that. Um, I think there's hope to achieve that, just like there's hope to achieve ethical attitudes, pro-sociality towards caring about the future. It's not just the current pandemic that that's the problem. We're making less progress in that direction than I would have hoped, but it, as, you, as you know, it's very much dependent upon societies. So I think an ethical shift is important and I think it's achievable at least to some extent, although there are some who will um, never take the societal um, um, beneficial attitude. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Levin, for your wonderful talk. It is, we are really privileged and honored by the presence uh, of you in our e-conference. And well, I'm glad, let, glad to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Okay. And let me, let me convey the greetings of Professor Mayan Mimura from Japan. Now it is late night in Japan. That's why he couldn't join today. Hopefully tomorrow he will join. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And I'll stop sharing. Okay. So once again, I'd like to... Yes, please. Uh, so there is a uh, small appreciation on behalf of the society. So I'd like to share that one. So this is uh, an appreciation on behalf of the Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology to Professor Dr. Simon Lavin. So once again, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks and gratitude to Professor Simon Levin to join with us. So thank you very much, Professor Simon Levin. Thank you, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to move to our next session. I mean, today's last session, session 1C. So the next speaker is uh, Professor Ellen Hustings. Professor Ellen Hustings, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I just had to unmute. Yes, okay. So I'd like to welcome you to the International E-Conference on Recent Advances in Biomathematics. So Professor Ellen Hustings will talk on ecological dynamics through time. So before that, I'd like to take the opportunity to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to Professor Ellen Hustings for receiving our invitation within very short time. And we are really honored and privileged by the presence of Professor Ellen Hustings. So this session is chaired by Professor Dr. Chandranath Poddar, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. So Professor Dr. Chandranath Poddar is also one of the founding members of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. Now I'd like to request Professor Dr. Chandranath Poddar to conduct this session. Now over to Professor Dr. Chandranath Poddar. Thank you very much, Dr. Humayun Kabir, Secretary of Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. Uh, very good evening, good morning, and also good afternoon, because this is an international e-conference. Yes. Uh, we are from Bangladesh, and our speakers are from different parts of the world, USA, Canada, China, and the uh, uh, different countries, and also the particip participants, they are also from different countries. So that's why very good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everybody. I welcome you on behalf of the Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology uh, to the International e Conference on Recent Advances in Biomathematics. This is our third session for today, and uh, uh, this is our last session, actually. And in this session, uh, our keynote sp speaker uh, is distinguished Professor Dr. Alan Hastings, and he will be talking on ecological dynamics through time. Professor Alan Hustings is a distinguished professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy 
California University, USA. He completed his PhD in applied mathematics at Cornell University in 1977 under the supervision of Professor Simon L. Levin, who just spoke. It was a very excellent uh, talk by Simon L. Levin. Professor Husting is theoretical ecologist. His current research focuses on invasive species, marine ecology and fisheries, transient dynamics in ecology, special ecology, and experiments with trivoleum. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Society. Association for the Advancement of Science, the Ecological Society for America, and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Professor Husting is also a recipient of the Robert H. MacArthur Award from the Ecological Society of America. He has been serving in numerous editorial boards, including Theoretical Ecology, Ecological Complexity, Journal of Mathematical Biology, and Movement Ecology, etc. He was the president of Society for Mathematical Biology in 2001 to 2002. He was the director of research training grant in nonlinear dynamics and biology, University of California. He was also the chair of theoretical ecology section of Ecological Society of America and NIMBIOS Advisory Board. Professor Alan Hustings has given many invited talk and keynote lectures all over the country, all over the world. He has also written a good number of books that includes uh, population biology, concepts and models, Encyclopedia of Theoretical Ecology, Ecosystem Engineering, Plans to Protests, Models in Population Biology, and many other. His remarkable contribution enriched the present research scale of mathematical biology. So I welcome our today speaker, Professor Dr. Alan Husting, to present his important lecture to our virtual audience, Professor Dr. Alan Husting. Uh, thank you. Let me see if I can do the screen sharing. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Try to see where I think I'd be good with this part. No? Okay, here we go. Uh, thank you again for the uh, very kind introduction and uh, for the invitation. It is really a pleasure to be able to participate in this conference. It's also uh, a pleasure, of course, to follow uh, Simon Levin, who uh, gave a very interesting lecture. So I'm going to be talking about ecological dynamics through time. And I want to start off with a caricature of essentially a lot of classical ecological theory that sort of 20 or 30 years ago or, or some point where one would have started off with a fairly simple model that was a description, a generic model here could be a local Volterra model. And the parameters in the model would also be assumed to be independent of time. So there's no explicit time variable on the right hand side. Uh, one would look for a stable equilibrium and think that this would correspond in some sense to a natural ecological system. And I think that we can point out that uh, I could put uh, X's uh, through everything probably even in terms of natural ecological system where I have quotes around it because it is uh, something 
that is perhaps uh, not realistic. Uh, we now would think of, of not having models that are deterministic and actually how you do that is, is much more subtle than I think a lot of people have, have thought about. Uh, we would typically often want to think very much about dependence of the right-hand side on time. And uh, then also we don't necessarily think we want to think about stable equilibria and uh, as I said, natural ecological system. So I wanna move away from these simple ideas, uh, which are very useful and look at aspects. And so one, from a mathematical standpoint, there one would want to focus on dynamics that are transient. One would want to at least think about non-autonomous systems and think very much about realistic approaches to stochasticity. So large stochastic events hurricanes, floods, uh, things which have a large effect uh, play a big role. And at the same time uh, that the way it's often done, things can be unbounded and that's also not necessarily realistic. Now, in the time that I have today, I'm probably really only going to get through the, the first of these topics in any detail. And uh, uh, let me point out that if we're thinking about in particular managing an ecological system, we've got several different timescales that enter into the thinking. One would be the timescale of any social system. Uh, we've heard about that relative to uh, epidemics, uh, the, the discussion at the end of uh, Professor Levin's talk on uh, COVID dynamics. Uh, you've got change in human behavior. You've got the time scale of the ecological system. So an ep epidemic in this case proceeds very quickly and the time scales to make decisions. And these can be mismatched in a variety of ways. Uh, we can think about ecological or uh, other systems that move very quickly like an epidemic that is hard to deal with. But similarly, uh, systems like uh, much of global change, which moves very slowly, is also hard to deal with because any action that is taken does not have an effect, perhaps until far in the future, so harder to justify. So I'm going to do something much, much more limited today in order to get some ideas across. I'm going to look about transients. I'm going to start off with a very simple system, which uh, is linear, and think about uh, marine protected areas. Then I'm going to add in an abstract way density dependence. And then I'm going to point out that one can begin to uh, develop general principles for transient dynamics. So I'll turn to something that's, that's close to where I am and something that uh, continue to work on with uh, colleagues, which is thinking about marine protected areas in California, areas where fishing or other activities may be prohibited, and are they working? So if you take an action, does it work? So marine protected areas in California were established according to legislative acts, the California Marine Life Protection Act. And on the right side of the screen, there's just a bunch of dots and, and the, the exact bits are not important, but just to see that uh, this is a map of California and uh, the Pacific Ocean on the left there. And the dots represent locations of, of areas that were set aside. And there's lots of marine protected areas around the world, but are they working? And you can measure that by looking at particular overviews, which is in the bottom right of this slide. I think if I do this over, whoops, that did not work. Okay. In the bottom right uh, of the slide, that the uh, many cases, various measures like biomass or density go up, but other cases they go down. So are they working? So adaptive management of marine protected areas. Hmm. Uh, to the screen. I think you're not seeing my full screen. Is that right? Uh, we need to, to basically, you need to know if they're working. 
because decisions need to be made. And in order to know if they're working, you need to know what to monitor. So uh, you need to choose how to do this. So what we wanna do is are they working and how soon can we tell? And in particular, they have a number of benefits but can we tell if they're really working? So you would increase, uh, the idea would be to increase biomass, increase larvae that, that move outside the area, which would then may, maybe yield an increase in, in fishing yield. And so one question is what happens first? And the idea would be that the key to understanding this question is to include the age structure of the fish in the fishing area. And we're going to think of this from the simplest approach. We're thinking of it from a single species of population dynamics approach. So this is a graph uh, illustrating just the population density against the age of the, the uh, fish. And the idea would be that the fished age structure is outlined in red. And if there was no fishing, you'd have an age structure that indicated in blue. So with fishing, the older and the bigger fish are not there because those are the ones that are caught into the fishery. And so a structure is the key. And the idea would be that what happens first is the system fills in that individuals which are no longer fished begin to be able to mature to become larger and larger, which then uh, means that abundance increases and the overall production of new individuals increases through time. And what this does is that models can show how this abundance changes and how much and when. And so in the upper right here, we have the population density uh, relative to the density before the marine protected area was implemented, plotted through time. And you have three different possibilities. In the top blue curve is where a fairly high fishing mortality rate F and the bottom with a lower fishing mortality rate. And one can look at the maximum increase can be expressed very, very simply in terms of the natural mortality rate and the fishing harvest rate by this very simple equation. And the time scale of filling in is determined by the natural mortality rate by this, again, very simple expression because it's a linear model. And so what we did is we did this for a number of particular species that are found in marine protected areas, potentially along the west coast of the US. And what we can do is show that for different uh, species, and these are three different species, uh, each row is a different species, and the column on the left is the abundance and the column on the right is the biomass. And the idea is that in order to show that the uh, marine protect area is actually having an effect, and this is uh, including stochasticity, which is why there's simulations, and it's an open population dynamics where recruitment is coming outside the protected area. And what you would want to see that it's working is to find a large difference as in here and to have the difference show up relatively quickly over you know, a time scale that is, that is actually realistic. And so uh, using this, we can suggest which species you should try and go out and count uh, the circled in the upper left, ones that fill in quickly, fill in very, where there's a rapid response and a relatively large response. Uh, even though there's a relatively large response for these species over here, it happens too slowly. And this response is too small to see quickly. So this provides a great benefit in terms of designing a monitoring plan. And we're continuing this work. And uh, a number of our publications are found on uh, Will White's uh, website here. Uh, and I'll leave that for a second or two. And what I'm going to do now is transition to more general systems. We're gonna add density dependence. And so uh, I'm gonna go back to something I did a long time ago. I've been 
maybe not quite as long as Professor Levin, but I've been doing this for a while. So uh, I'm going to add density dependence and look at a very, very simple system. So in this system, we have, uh, we can think of it as larvae as produced at a location uh, Y and the larvae that are produced at Y are produced according to a typical density dependent over compensatory density dependent uh, description. The exact description really doesn't matter here, it turns out. And one has the uh, uh, production like this. We have a dispersal kernel because this is a spatial model. Y is a spatial location X, continuous space. The uh, probability in some sense that an individual that's produced at uh, Y lands at X or produced at X lands at Y, it doesn't matter, it's symmetric, is given by uh, this uh, description, it's a Gaussian, and it's a fairly narrow Gaussian. And the full dynamics say that the number of individuals at location X is equal to those that are produced at Y and then travel from Y to X, and we sum over all possible locations Y where they could have been produced. And if we do this and we plot this, the total integral, so the integrate N over L and look at the total through time. And what you have is we increase the density dependence, uh, increase R, increase the growth rate R, which increases the density dependence as well. That as we get even beyond a little bit uh, of uh, increasing R, we get very long, potentially transient dynamics. This time scale is 20,000 time steps. Uh, so the realistic dynamics are going to occur over a very short time scale. And you see sudden changes in behavior with no external influence. And what this suggests is that thinking about the long-term behavior is not relevant for an ecological time scale. Uh, one can show that this has effects more than just changing the dynamics, a very simple model of two, uh, uh, hosts and one parasitoid. So parasitoids are insects that make their living by laying their eggs in developing stages of another insect. Here's a case where the uh, 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 developing larvae or pupae of the host and what's inside is not the host, but the parasitoid. And typically these are set up so that the enemy of my enemy is my friend in some sense, that this is apparent, more or less apparent competition will show up as it's called, that if we have a host which supports a higher level of a parasitoid than another host, it will eliminate the second host. However, if you set this up in a uh, spatial setting with the kinds of dynamics I just said, the very, very long transients and the exact details here don't matter, but I have a model with uh, spatially implicit, one parasitide, two hosts with random movement of organisms, uh, discrete time. And the, the whole point of this is that there's large slices through a fairly complex six dimensional parameter space, which is why there's many, many uh, graphs here that the uh, colors show that uh, very, very long uh, coexistence occurs, long time until there's an extinction event where extinction is falling below a, a fairly high threshold. And so the idea that the asymptotic behavior tells you what's going on from an ecological standpoint is not correct. So uh, these particular examples, and I uh, did a few more over the a course of, of, of quite a long time. You saw the first uh, uh, reference was to a paper from uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, much more recently, over the last few years, been working uh, with a great uh, group of individuals at Nimbus, uh, National, the US National Institute for Mathematical Biology and Synthesis sponsored by NSF. And uh, this group is, is pictured here. Uh, quickly, Sergei Petrovsky, Mary Lou Zeman, who attended this meeting virtually, hence a sort of pasted in picture, Ying Cheng Lai, Tessa Francis, uh, Karen Abbott, uh, K. 
Kim Cunnington, Gabriel Gellner, Katie Scranton, Andrew Morozov. And uh, we've produced uh, several papers, including one that is uh, just uh, uh, going to appear soon, very, very soon uh, on management implications with Tessa Francis as the first author. And so we showed and tried to make much more systematic and uh, so an overview with a more ecological description is, is here, a uh, paper that has much more of the mathematical details and is much longer because uh, in science you can only have a short paper is, is this one in physics of life reviews. And the idea is we wanted to show when transients arise and use this from essentially a dynamical system standpoint. So what do we mean by transient? Well, first of all, a transient would then be dynamics that is not the long-term behavior. So an asymptotic state, is, as many of you must know, could be uh, uh, equilibrium point, could be limit cycle, could be a uh, strange attractor. And a long transient would be last longer than you think would be a crude definition. We don't necessarily have an exact definition. Long enough, it looks like asymptotic behavior. And it's roughly dozens of generations or more, which is sort of using ideas from non-dimensionalization, saying using a time scale relative to what's going on. And that's what we've got sort of illustrated here is that you observe, for example, here you'd observe this and think, gee, that's, that's the long-term behavior in a noisy sense. There's lots of empirical examples. And I recognize though, perhaps it's uh, easier on the screen than it would be in a room to read some of these. And this is from that paper in science. We have lots of different uh, examples of uh, long-term transients for em empirical systems, which range from laboratory populations of, of flower beetles to benthic fishes, to coral and mackerel algae, to uh, uh, number of other systems. Uh, one would be laboratory populations of flower beetles in work by Bob Costantino, Jim Cushing, uh, Bob Descharnay, and uh, I'm gonna having a moment where I'm forgetting the, the last uh, author who's a statistician at the University of Idaho. And I'm just blanking. These are two different replicates. Uh, each column represents a different replicate. Each row represents a different life stage of the flower beetle tribolium, larvae, pupae, and adults. And they've done their sort of counting by, by lumping uh, uh, um, very large larvae in with pupae, et cetera. They make it so that the stages each last about the time. And on the left, what you see is that Eventually, the population goes into a cycle every other measurement step, it's high and low. The replica on the right is always there, but the replica on the left has a period where the number of larvae is constant through time. That is a transient. It's a non theosototic behavior. It lasts long enough that if you were to observe it, you might think the system has settled down to an equilibrium. Uh, Dungeness crab, this is uh, a species which is harvested off the west coast of, uh, northwest coast of the United States. Uh, this is a picture, uh, work again from quite a while ago. We developed a detailed model of the Dungeness crab dynamics. And on the right hand side of this, which includes all these different life stages, you observe the harvested individuals. And on the right, uh, we have one step ahead predictions plotted against the actual dynamics. So the open circle is the prediction, the closed circle is the actual dynamics through time at eight different ports with a log scale uh, on the left uh, on the vertical axis, a log scale of the harvest. And dramatic oscillations, very good predictions. And what we can see in this is that, uh, sorry, uh, is that you get these oscillations and why do we call this a transient? Well, if you had, did not have the stochastic effects, which are really important here, these are the 
stochastic effects in the uh, dynamics or play a big role that without that, uh, these populations would all settle down to a, a stable equilibrium. So the stochasticity keeps it on a transient, which is a large scale uh, oscillation. And what we can do is we can begin to classify transients just the same way you classify different uh, uh, behavior of dynamical systems like limit cycles and chaos. And the, uh, we can get a, a ghost attractor. Here we have a system where uh, for the parameter value I'm showing, I've got a three species system where there's a resource, a consumer of the resource and the predator on the resource. And for this parameter value, you have a uh, chaotic attractor and you also have at the same time an alternate uh, stable and attracting behavior, a limit cycle with the top uh, species absent. And what one can do is show the dynamics through time and you see that you have two possible dynamics. And now I'm gonna change parameter values so that the only uh, long-term stable behavior is the solution with the top species absent. And this is the dynamics through time if we start near the uh, chaotic invariant set now uh, that I will put to you that there's absolutely no way that you would distinguish this dynamic from this dynamic on the top, from the bottom, from the top, yet the bottom is only a transient. We can have crawl buys uh, is another classification that we describe, which I'm going to illustrate. I'm going to illustrate the next few examples using the very simple uh, predator prey dynamics. So this is the prey, this is the predator, very simple sort of classic MacArthur Rosenzweig model with a functional response describing the consumption of the prey by the predator, a logistic growth, and other than that, very standard phase plane, no transients as you have uh, this example, but then it get, you can change parameters. So it gets very close to the saddles in the system. There's a saddle at zero, zero. There's a saddle at, uh, at K uh, zero. And we know that the saddle is in equilibrium. So the system slows way down because at, right at the saddle, the rate of change would be zero. And then therefore you get these long periods where the system is not changing either at the top or the bottom of the prey density as illustrated on the right. And if you observe the system there, you might observe that it was not uh, changing at all. Similar dynamics would show up uh, very much if you thought about outbreaks of a disease that would be described by an SIR dynamic with some slow change of population underneath it. Slow fast dynamics. If you have very different time scales of prey and predator, the uh, graph of the limit cycle in the phase plane would look as in uh, uh, panel E, and you would see that there's a time when the, uh, the uh, gets very close to the axis with very little prey. So there's a time when the prey density is changing very, very slowly once that uh, begins to increase, then there's a rapid increase and a fairly rapid decrease, and then again, a period of stasis. So uh, high dimension was essentially the uh, reason for the stochasticity, uh, high dimension and stochasticity uh, can be uh, two other cases, which I illustrated with specific examples before. And for each of these types of transients, ghosts, crawl buys, slow fast, high dimension, which was the spatial model, the stochasticity, which was the Dungeness crab. We have particular examples of empirical systems, of biological systems that actually show this. And uh, 
I guess I didn't update this. Uh, uh, just uh, just noticing this is now in press in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, uh, a paper emphasizing how important this is for uh, management. So I will now very very briefly uh, touch on a description of non-autonomous systems, which introduces all sorts of interesting. Uh, uh, other ideas. And uh, this, my work here came out of, uh, again, a, a different group. Uh, and in particular, a lot of it's been done uh, in collaboration with uh, Martin Rasmussen, who's second from the right in this uh, graph or in this picture. And there I am on the left. And <clears throat> we did this for thinking very much about the terrestrial carbon cycle, where you have uh, plants uh, where the carbon uh, comes from the atmosphere, potentially. Uh, plant takes carbon dioxide uh, and, uh, and, and exchanges with the atmosphere. Litter, uh, plants die, form litter, but then uh, carbon from there, the litter then eventually the carbon in it ends up in the soil as the litter decays. There's also an exchange out to the atmosphere. And the time evolution of this can be described by a very simple uh, box model where uh, you have input from the outside. You have the mass decaying in each pool, it's continuous time. So this is the rate of decay of carbon in any pool down the diagonal. And Bij is the rate at which carbon moves from one pool to a different pool. And the mass leaving the system is then the fact that the sums of the Bij's, the sum over i, the uh, row sum, is less than, is negative, meaning that uh, carbon actually is, is leaving. And if you have a one-dimensional example, you have this very simple decay model. Uh, your early students would be able to solve this. And then you can compute the transit time, how long it takes from carbon that enters the system to leave on average is given very simply by the formula at the bottom. And you can then begin to extend this. Once you have two pools, you can have an exchange between the two pools and then a rate at which uh, things can leave. And you can have the average time in the system for a particle has entered a pool either from outside uh, the system or from another pool. And what one can do is we can compute this transit time quite simply for uh, a d-dimensional system. No matter how the dimensions, it's a very simple formula in terms of the inverse of the matrix describing the, the pools. But uh, climate change will make a lot of these systems, the things in brown, these now become rates which are changing through time due to changes in the amount of, of uh, changes in, in the global temperature and changes in, in the rate at which humans have been putting carbon by burning fossil fuels. And so every entry here has to become time dependent. And now uh, it turns out uh, that this system, although it's linear, unlike a, a standard linear uh, matrix model that is autonomous, you can't solve it. You can't get stability is not deduced by the eigenvalues of the matrices, basically because the eigenvectors are changing through time. And you can have two different kinds of transit times. One is the average time of a particle in the system uh, that it stays in once it, the, the particle that's entering now, how long it stays in the system from now to the future and the mean age of the particles that are leaving. And this is useful for understanding. And we developed an approach. Uh, this is a particular uh, model for a terrestrial carbon cycle with different rates of exchange among the pools, uh, the plants, litter, and soil, and different rates at which carbon enters. It enters directly into the plants only. And what we can do is uh, we run the model, have it 
uh, essentially reached an equilibrium up until 1850, at which point humans began burning lots of fossil fuels, and look at the transit time and mean age compared with the instantaneous quantities, and you see there's a huge difference. Uh, there is a slight thing, and notice that the scale is not zero, but there still is a very, very big difference between the instantaneous uh, time and the actual time. So uh, one can go through, figure out various details, and I think it's, I think I should be wrapping up pretty soon. Is that correct? I think. Look at my watch. Uh, the what proportion of the transit time t is is spent in each pool? This can be answered using the extended mean age equation, uh, and you get the relative changes of transit times in different pools. And we've now been uh, applying these ideas to uh, a, a different system, uh, essentially looking at uh, states that a particular species is in through time. So uh, let me uh, point out, you get a non-autonomous model for the, the breeding states and you get a main question, what's the expected number of breeding attempts during the lifetime of this? And that corresponds to the forward transit time. And let me finish up by spending a, a fair amount of time on the uh, conclusions that I, I wanted to emphasize. One is that on ecological time scales, asymptotic behavior may be uh, essentially irrelevant that you really need to think about uh, transient dynamics. We have a really good understanding of the very long-term behavior of deterministic systems. And on the other hand, and we also have on a very, very short time scale, uh, we have good understanding of the behavior of systems because that always reduces to something linear, but it's this intermediate time scale and it's also for systems which are stochastic and systems which are non-autonomous. So there's great mathematical challenges. And this perhaps relates to some of the, the questions at the end of uh, Professor Levin's uh, presentation about uh, comments about whether or not models are too, too, too simple. Transient dynamics are particularly important for thinking about human interventions because we are particularly interested in uh, how things play out over a short time scale. And also for human interventions, we very much would need to typically show uh, that these interventions are having the desired effect because uh, any intervention represents a cost of some kind. It could be a financial cost. It could be a, a cost of, of required change in behavior. Uh, we've shown through our work that many ecological systems definitely can exhibit uh, transient dynamics. So this is not just a purely mathematical uh, uh, phenomenon, but we are able to find it in a number of empirical systems. There are also a number of challenges. One of them is that if you have a system and you observe it over time, how can you tell if that is asymptotic behavior or if that's a transient? And this is a, certainly a, an empirical and a very much of a data question. Uh, there's very much of progress. One of the ways that things have changed greatly over the decades has been an increase in uh, sophistication of statistical approaches for interpreting ecological data and using that in a way to feed back into uh, mathematical descriptions. On a more helpful note, uh, concepts from dynamical systems uh, begin to provide a way to classify and understand transient dynamics, why they occur, when we would expect them to occur. Uh, many of you presumably are very familiar with uh, the large body of work uh, that's discussed what are uh, colloquially known as tipping points. Uh, Martin Scheffer uh, and colleagues 
have been particularly active in this. And a lot of this has been displayed in terms of thinking about early warning signs for uh, these tipping points where the idea is a slow change in a parameter uh, then would be eventually lead to a large change in the behavior of the system as it passes through a bifurcation. That uh, I will add here that this is a phenomenon that actually has a lot of uh, association with transience. Uh, first of all, what's called a parameter here or could be called a variable in a slow fast dynamic. That one of the great interests would be that after the system has passed through the bifurcation, is there time to recover before the system moves to a different state that is uh, potentially much less desirable? And that has very much to do with transients. And I'll just throw in, though I don't uh, have it as a uh, bullet point, but we'll see on the next slide another aspect. Uh, projecting forward requires uh, taking into account uh, changing conditions. So thinking about uh, uh, non-autonomous systems that uh, much, much mathematical analysis uh, has been devoted to autonomous systems. That's the standard approach. But we very much have cases where there is changing conditions through time. How does that play out? And that plays out even in uh, bifurcations where you, and tipping points, uh, in particular with tipping points where you can have tipping points due to bifurcations, you can have tipping points due to uh, changes in the uh, parameters through time, uh, where this idea that, that uh, the equilibrium can be moving and the changing conditions can uh, make it so that a system leaves the basin of attraction for the equilibrium under consideration. This is a lot of uh, uh, work on this has been done by Sebastian Wozorczyk and Peter Ashwin and their colleagues. Uh, the, even the simplest linear systems show the challenges that arise when taking into account changing conditions and uh, basically, it's clear that insights from autonomous systems can be very misleading. The example that I know I went through a bit uh, too quickly with the global carbon cycle is an example that shows how trying to relate predictions to just a, a map from current parameter values can be particularly misleading. Uh, much more work is needed on non-autonomous systems. And I started off today with a slide uh, showing that stochasticity or commenting that stochasticity is, stochasticity is really important and trying to understand many, many issues with stochasticity and making it much more reflective of the kinds of stochasticity that really appear in ecological systems is a great challenge. And another great challenge that way is that for ecological systems, we don't have uh, typically many, many replicates. So the extent to which understanding the distribution of outcomes is what we want to do is not necessarily uh, reflective of what we want to understand uh, fully uh, the consequences of stochasticity for ecological systems. So I'll stop here, but first I wanted to thank you very much again for the invitation to join your e-conference. I am very honored by the invitation and I would like to wish you uh, luck and success uh, going forward in uh, building up mathematical biology in Bangladesh and in surrounding areas as well. So again, thank you very much. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you would have. Okay, thank you very much, Professor 
Alan Husting. Congratulations for your nice and excellent talk to our audience. And, uh, and also, I would like to uh, thank to our dear audience for their kind patience hearing and their presence. Uh, thank you very much. Now I would like to request Professor Dr. Humayun to uh, conduct the question and answer session, please. Now over to Dr. Humayun Kabir, please. Thank you, sir. So first of all, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks and gratitude to Professor Ellen Hastings for joining with us. And I have received a couple of questions from the audience. The first question is, so would you please tell something about how frequency domain analysis can be used for analyzing a dynamical system so, by ODs? So uh, frequency domain analysis. Analysis, so, yes. So uh, one way that I'd understand that would be that uh, um, I've sort of plotted things or, or emphasized very much uh, the, the time domain here. And uh, one of the ways, for example, that uh, stochastic systems can in some sense have a uh, uh, mimic and in some sense have a transient is that if we look at the frequency domain of a system that would have a stable equilibrium that uh, in a deterministic sense, that if you perturb it stochastically uh, continually through time, that the frequency uh, description of it, so plotting rather than the, the time uh, applying the frequency, that would give you a description that would look very much like a limit cycle. And in uh, very recent work that uh, we're currently in the process of writing up with, uh, uh, where we're using actually ideas from statistical physics to look at spatial population dynamics, we're able to sort of tease apart some more ideas here uh, that give us some more insights into how to do that kind of uh, analysis. So I, I hope I've uh, at least touched on what the question was was about okay thank you thank you very much uh, the next question is uh, which modeling approach uh, would you like to suggest for modeling structured system structured system what kind of modeling so, approach so for spatially structured systems and I'll, I'll take it meaning that for now that there's a number of modeling approaches and they each have their uh their benefit and each have their, their drawback. So uh, that this is a case where we know that the world is in some sense complex and that any particular model, you're distilling out the pieces that you want to look at. Uh, and as well that as the sort of simple models, you can get very general conclusions. And for complex models, you can get maybe less general conclusions. And the other would be <coughs> that at times we have to think about uh, the idea that, that our choices may be influenced by the purpose and how much data we can uh, get. So in relatively data poor situations, you want to use uh, rather general models and simple models where you get general principles so that you can make predictions which don't necessarily depend on the details of the data. And otherwise you might want to use uh, very, very detailed models. So I presented uh, sort of in passing two different kinds of, of spatial models. One where I said, okay, I'm going to have a, a particular uh, system where it's explicitly spatial, where I looked at the rate at which individuals move from one location to the next. Uh, that was the integral difference equation. I also mentioned without any of the details, a model where 
I said it was spatially implicit. And obviously, uh, it's easier to analyze a spatially implicit model. Uh, it reduces typically to an ordinary differential equation. The integral difference equation model, or analogously, a reaction diffusion model is more complicated. One could go even, even further and make a model spatially uh, realistic. And some of those, one might use uh, simulation-based approaches, which might go into the terminology of something like uh, uh, agent-based models. And with, there's a large literature in a variety of fields that, that do that. And uh, in the ecological setting, there's been a lot of work by Volker Grimm and Steve Railsback. And then similarly, uh, one might want to use uh, network models, which in some sense is a different form of a spatially realistic perhaps, or you might get general principles. Those would be used a lot potentially for even for thinking in, in epidemics about how individuals affect each other. And the idea would be that you want to put in just enough details to get the answer you want. And the other is, that you might want to uh, try multiple approaches. And one approach that I've, uh, not in any of the work I, I presented today, but it's come up a number of times in work that I've done, where we've used a spatially explicit simulation. And at the same time, we've used a, uh, a much simpler analytic model. And the first thing that we did was show that the simpler analytic model uh, could reflect much of the behavior of the spatially explicit simulation model, which gives you much more confidence that both are correct. And then if you want to think about management approaches, which are typically done using optimization ideas, that doing that in the context of a simulation approach is very difficult. Whereas doing that in the context of a simpler analytic model is uh, much easier. And so uh, that way, then sort of say, okay, doing both is really important to show that the simpler model actually is a, it's a good description. But then when I want to analyze management approaches, I'll do it with the simpler analytic model. So that's a, a very good question because that's a very difficult and, and interesting uh, uh, issue to approach. And uh, I think that the bottom line would be to use a variety of different approaches. So I'll thank you there. very much. Thank you very much. We have uh, two more questions. So what kind of mathematical models uh, or mathematical tools can be frequently used to detect transient dynamics? So this is something which is uh, a challenge that we have recognized that uh, what we would like to do is uh, there's several ideas. One would be that if we can get a very good uh, mathematical description of the system, we should be able to see if there's transients. Now, one challenge is something that uh, we only briefly mentioned is that we can, if we have a system which has transient dynamics, uh, we can reproduce the transient dynamics by a related model for which the transient dynamic is the asymptotic dynamics. And so that suggests this is a very, very difficult problem. There are potentially uh, ideas from time series analysis that would be able to detect uh, some of these ideas and some of the early warning sign approaches which look at questions like autocorrelation of time series that are stochastic uh, and, and other ideas which often go into the term critical slowing down, uh, re slower return to equilibrium uh, and, and related aspects may provide hints. But I think that that question identifies what is actually a great challenge and one that uh, we are currently thinking very much about. So again, that's a very good, good point. Thank you. So the next question is, uh, Techniques of stochastic simulation sometimes leads to different type of solution patterns. Is there any way to validate which techniques provide the correct one? 
So there, uh, I would argue that there's lots of work that needs to be done because uh, much of what we do with stochastic uh, simulations is based on a particular description of the stochasticity. Um, one of the, the people that's involved in this group who are looking at transients, uh, the, the one I pointed out, Mary Lou Zeman, has been working a lot with what uh, she has, I don't know if she's the one that came up with the term, but what are called flow kick systems. So rather than uh, the stochasticity sort of continually through time, uh, this is a system where you have flow, the, the sense that it's the determinist flow alternating with a stochastic kick, a stochastic, uh, large stochastic influence of different, potentially different sizes. And uh, understanding those dynamics is very, very different. So uh, I think that a real challenge, and again, the, all these questions are very good because they're really sort of focusing on, on future questions, not on, on things that we know well. A real challenge is to think about putting in realistic descriptions of stochasticity into systems. Uh, I know that mathematically I'm less familiar with this work other than to know that it exists and, and seen some of the consequences. There are a lot of standard mathematical descriptions of stochasticity at this point consist of adding a term corresponding to uh, white noise with a small parameter in front. So uh, that leads to one kind of description. And th that's difficult in a couple of ways. One is that, the no that it can become unbounded, uh, the, the influence of the noise, which can cause some problems. On the other hand, there's a small parameter and that's also unrealistic. So uh, sort of strikingly, one can begin to look at, at large but bounded uh, noise as a way to include stochasticity. And that in itself leads to very different dynamics. And if you were to uh, think from a biological standpoint, there's lots of ways to include uh, noise once you get the very explicit inclusion of, of mechanisms that produce noise. And so uh, again, in uh, much older work with Brett Melbourne, uh, we looked at the dynamics of flower beetle populations and found that uh, many people are familiar with what ecologists would call environmental stochasticity, the role of changing in the environment, uh, demographic stochasticity, the idea essentially the role of birth death in uh, uh, aspects in small populations. But a final bit would be what we call demographic heterogeneity, which uh, uh, is also well known. We didn't coin the term, but putting all of them together gives you very different aspects. And the idea of demographic heterogeneity is that in a small popula relatively small population, that different individuals would have different uh, characteristics to their birth or death probabilities than other individuals. So the birth and death rates would be drawn themselves from a distribution. That has a big effect actually on the overall dynamics. And in some sense, this has to be uh, related to the idea that even in say for an epidemic, different individuals have different rates at which they spread the disease for a variety of reasons. So just assuming that uh, uh, there are different rates of contact for different individuals, but if those are innately different, rather than just due to random sort of small population uh, effects or random effects, that would again add greatly to the stochastic dynamics. So uh, I would say that there's still lots of work that needs to be done to truly understand the role of stochasticity in ecological or population dynamics. Uh, thank you. Uh, one supplement, supplementary question regarding that. Uh, the question is sometimes stochastic simulation and ODE simulation provide different results. 
So how could we relate these two different results with the biology that the model is built on? So one of them is that any kind of simulation will give you a range of results. The, uh, is one answer to that. Another answer is that there are more and more sophisticated approaches if you have reasonable data for analyzing time series uh, that the, one can use uh, hierarchical uh, approaches to understanding time series of data. And there are various challenges there in the fact that ecological systems are quite high dimensional and any observations we make are relatively low dimensional. So many interacting pieces through time. Uh, our observations as well are full of uh, error uh, in the noise in the observation. And again, uh, there are better techniques uh, appearing and, and can be used for, for looking at uh, this uh, uh, analysis of time series. And the way in which uh, the outcomes of the different simulations differ really do just show, show a range of behavior that we shouldn't necessarily be thinking about any predictions we're making for the future as ones where we have this as a single outcome, but we have a range of outcomes through time. And we should appreciate the uncertainty of any predictions of future outcomes that any prediction should be accompanied by a very large or very careful description of any uncertainty in the description. And I would submit that people have a very poor understanding of uncertainty. I mean, sort of human, so sort of almost human nature of not being able to understand, not being, having a good grasp of that. And that's one challenge we face as, as mathematicians providing descriptions of systems. Uh, thank you. Maybe this is the last question because uh, it's uh, uh, 11 already. So <laughs> can transient dynamics be used to model the human psychological patterns shaped by the spatial confinement due to the COVID-19 lockdown policy? So certainly uh, the answer to that would be an unqualified yes, that transients are absolutely essential for understanding epidemics and their impacts and all sorts of other aspects. Uh, uh, this is sort of even one of the first examples that, that kind of uh, led me to thinking about uh, uh, transient dynamics. So, so even independent of the human response, just the whole idea of a uh, epidemic, if it's an epidemic, it, at the beginning, there was no disease. And then one essentially thinks at the end, there will be no or limited disease. And so uh, we're not really interested uh, in thinking when we're, we're thinking about dynamics here, that the fact that at some point the disease will go away, that's not particularly interesting and not particularly useful and not particularly important uh, to some extent. And so uh, in order to understand the, the course, the impact and uh, what we should do, we need to look at the dynamics through time rather than the long time behavior and the human response to it. We certainly would have one response over a shorter time scale. And the other is to sort of emphasize to people that be able to emphasize that no, this is not going to be going on forever uh, humans are really, maybe from an evolutionary standpoint, humans are really good at focusing on very short term time scales and not at thinking about uh, much longer ones. So again, uh, another very good question. Thank you. So once again, I'd like to thank Professor Ellen Hustings for your wonderful talk. I think uh, all the audience, including me, enjoyed a lot your talk. So. Before finishing, uh, may I request Professor Elon Husting? Okay, yes, it has been stopped. So now it is a small appreciation on behalf of the Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology to Professor Elon Husting. Thank you. So hopefully we will send it to Professor Elon Hustings later on. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you very much. And again, uh, great success in the future. And thank very you very honored much. Honored to be part of your first conference. So now I'd like to request to conduct, uh, to conclude the session, Professor Dr. Chandranath Puddar. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Humayun Kabir to conduct this question and answer session. And it was really, really a nice uh, presentation given by Dr. Hustin. And uh, we have learned a lot from his lecture and as well as from the previous two lecture. Uh, lecture. And uh, this is our today. And uh, tomorrow we have uh, another three invited uh, lectures. And uh, ho hopefully, uh, we'll be there all together and we'll learn a lot of things regarding the mathematical biology, ecology, and other uh, important things. So thank you very much. Again, a good night to everybody. Good evening to everybody. Good afternoon to everybody. So thank you very much for your patience hearing and to be part of this very important, uh, I think this is a very successful uh, International e conference organized by uh, Bangladesh Society for Mathematical Biology. And thank you once again. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Chandranath Poddar, for conducting this session. Now, I'd like to request Professor Dr. Haider Ali Bishas to say a few words, I mean, to conclude today's session. Thank you, Dr. Kabir. First, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Alan Husting. Uh, I especially I would like to thank because it is a long time. After a long time, I met Professor Hastings. In 2011, I met in MBI, Ohio State University. I went there for a young researcher workshop and I met with you. So it, I am very much pleased to have with us and uh, we have enjoyed your lecture here. I think all our audience from home and abroad have enjoyed and have learned a lot of things about ecological, epidemic model and some other uh, biological model. So we would be very much lucky when we could invite you physically in Bangladesh and we will arrange for an uh, international conference where we could meet physically and we could uh, share our views with our uh, audience and some other uh, specialist and distinguished scientist working in this area of special uh, topics of mathematics. So I think today in Bangladesh, it is almost late night and in other parts of the world. So our audience from different parts of the, of the world. So today's session, I think we would like to conclude here. And tomorrow we have another session, our second session. And the session, we have another four invited uh, keynote uh, talk tomorrow. So I think all audience from different parts of the globe, we enjoy uh, to this international uh, workshop, international conference, and they will share their views and their attraction to working on mathematical biology or mathematical ecology or epidemic model for a sustainable management of our human uh, life. So I would like to again thanks everybody for your patience and enjoying a, a very international forum today. And thank you all and good night, everybody. Thanks to all. Thank you very much. So uh, it's really my privilege to conclude this session. And once again, I'd like to thank Professor Chin Chuan Chan from Taiwan, Professor Semin, Semin Levin from United States of America, and Professor Ellen Hastings from United States of America. So we hope we will again invite Professor Simon Levin, Professor Ellen Hastings, and Professor Chin Chuan Chan physically in Bangladesh. So. Thank you all, and I'd like to invite you all to join the session four tomorrow at local time, 3 p.m., Bangladesh time, 3 p.m. So 
stay safe and stay fine so good night everybody thank you once again আদর স্যার यस তাহলে আলহামদুলিল্লাহ মোটামুটি सक्सेसफुल আজকে আর কি আজকে আসলে আমি सक्सेसफुली ও আই হ্যাভ ফিনিশ তাহলে ভাবে শেষ হলো মোটামুটি না খুব এবার আমার মনে হয় আমেরিকান স্পিকারদের আসলে অনেক ভোট তো বিশেষ করে অ্যালান হাস্টিং তার ওখানে তো 8টা 14 ঘন্টা অ্যালান হাস্টিং এর স্পেসিফিকে 14 ঘন্টা ডিফারেন্স আমাদের সাথে নেছি তার ফলে তারা ওনা তো টাইমলি একো ভরে ওনা দে উঠতে হইছে আর কি মানে হচ্ছে হ্যাঁ আরকি <laughs> 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 আমরা 